ICQ Podcast episode 332, exciting bumper new solar cycle. Well, hello and welcome fellow Amatam Radio enthusiasts to this, our 332nd episode of the ICQ Amatam Radio podcast. Supported this episode by Richard Langmead, 5B4, Alpha Juliet Golf, along of course with our monthly and subscription donors. In this episode, Martin M1MRB is joined by Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, and Bill, Whiskey Charlie 3, Bravo, to discuss the latest Amatown Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6BRY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is a discussion with Dr. Scott McIntosh uh, of the National Centre for the Atmospheric Research, located in Boulder, Colorado. And he's uh, talking to Frank, uh, Kilo 4 Foxtrot Mike Hotel, regarding the exciting bumper new solar cycle. Well, as always, it's your very kind donations that help keep uh, your show advert free. And uh, as a Richard 5B4 Alpha Juliet Golf uh, as a, has uh, found value in the show and pops along a donation. And he just sends his best wishes from him and his wife, Christine, uh, who uh, Martin and I know from our trips to Cyprus and chatting there to the guys at the uh, radio club there in Cyprus. So thank you very much, Richard, for supporting uh, your amateur radio show. As always, if you find uh, value in what we're doing, all we ask you to do to keep us out of it free is to pop along to www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. And whenever you find value in our show, feel free to uh, say send it along our way and say we'll keep producing shows for you advert free. Well, now let's get on with the show. And we're going to join uh, Martin, Chris, Martin, Ed, Frank and Bill to discuss the latest amateur radio news and generate thoughts about what's going on in our hobby as uh, they look at news stories, including cosmic ray predictions and hams assist with COVID-19 tracing. As always, really hope you enjoy the show. Hi guys, welcome to episode 332 of the ICQ podcast and tonight's the round table for that episode. Tonight, I'm joined by Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Hi Chris. Hi Martin, hi guys. Yeah, good to hear you again, Chris. I think this is like about the third or fourth time in about three days. But it's, it's one of those never- weeks where we get, yeah, it's one of those weeks, isn't it, Martin? We have every, every month where... Things are a bit bonkers, as we say over here. He certainly is. Also, uh, we have Mr. Martin Ruffell, M0SGL, who, uh, hello, Martin. And uh, I've got a great smile from your daughter this afternoon. She, she, she's loving that now. She's four months, four and a half months old. And, you know, everyone comes in, they come in, they look at her, they say hello, and she's big eye, her eyes light up, and she smiles. It's lovely. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. I've got a gorgeous smile from her. And I, and I met the lovely Emma, your good missus. Yeah. Well, you've uh, met Emma before, in fairness. I have, but I haven't seen her for right. a little while because it's been locked down, hasn't it? Yes. Right. Uh, moving over to Germany, we've got Mr. Adrian, DD5LP. Yeah, well, as long as Emma's uh, eye light, I, yeah, I'll try again. As long as Emma's eyes didn't light up when she saw you as well, Martin, we're, we're okay. No, um, no, I don't know her money. <laughs> <laughs> okay hi everybody uh, glad to be here again yeah cheers um moving uh over to the other side of the pond over the atlantic there uh we have mr frank l k4 fmh martin i've run out of fingers to count the episode since 300 332 wow glad to be with you today take your shoes and socks off you get more digits then well, I, I do have my socks off, so I guess I could be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to count your binary, Frank. <laughs> Maybe doing hex. That would perhaps sleep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hex. Yeah. That would help as well. 32. Yeah. Hex. Yeah. And uh, also at the other side of the pond with Frank, we have Mr. Bill Barnes, WC3B, who is also a computer literate and probably understood all that. Yeah, I don't really want to get into that, but it kind of doesn't work, especially with Frank's age. But <laughs> thanks, everybody, <laughs> and good evening. Oh, careful, Ooh, careful, careful Tiger. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, Frank, they're picking on us. Uh, well, I deserve it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Oh, dear. Let's start with the first news story. It's probably going to be a little bit of a quick one, but uh, researchers are predicting a surge in cosmic rays happening over the next few years that could uh, give us sputtering um, solar cycles. And 
problems for deep, deep space uh, missions. Bill, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, the base problem here is that uh, the stronger the solar cycle is with the sun, the more uh, solar rays and um, magnetic field it just pushes out and to the solar edge of the solar system and, and keeps the cosmic rays from coming in and messing your DNA up. Um, the article specifically mentions mentions back in the nineties, you, you'd probably be okay at, you know, a thousand days for, you know, an average, you know, they threw around the 45 year old astronaut, but now because, you know, plus we're in a solar minimum, we had a week solar cycle, uh, for 24, that uh, it's now down to maybe 290 days before uh, for men and 204 days for ladies that uh, exposure in space without, you know, the protection of the magnetic field um, starts messing with the, the DNA, I guess. So interesting article. And it, and it does talk about various things about the solar cycle that, you know, familiar with at this point but it was just interesting that they spun and rolled it into the the problem with the cosmic rays which is something i i never really gave a thought but it makes perfect sense you know without the strong magnetic field and the strong solar cycle you're going to get more you know cosmic rays coming in from other other locations into our solar system i wonder if this is a risk for perhaps not almost the astronauts because they're out right in space, but people that do a lot of flying, particularly people that work in that industry, because I do remember many years ago when I went to visit uh, an air museum where they had Concorde and they had the test, test plane. I think it was actually up in um, Duxford where they, 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 had, they have that at the aircraft that was one of the te test, test, test planes there for Concorde. I know that involved quite a lot of radiation measurement because they were concerned that when you were flying up that high up in the atmosphere that you would... Glad you asked. But go ahead. There's a, new, there's a new sensor. It's also on spaceweather.com under the article Cosmic Rays in the Atmosphere called ERAD, Empirical Radiation Mod. They're flying radiation sensors aboard airplanes in the U.S. and around the world. They've got 22,000 GPS tag radiation measurements. If you look at spaceweather.com, you can look at the dose rate which is how toxicologists measure. You know, you can dive anything. You can eat too much salt, but yeah. the dose response level for salt is kind of way high. And so they've actually got a table with the duration on flights by different airline. So very cool comment. And here's the data for it. Spaceweather.com for uh, August 24th. Back to the original story, but you're spot on, sir. Thank you. So I was wondering if we actually have to limit uh, flights for you know pilots and cabin crew. That's so all. If that's going to be a concern going forward, yeah. If you watch Doctor Scobe's weekly uh, space weather report, she covers that every single week and has been for a long time. That it's uh, you know quite dangerous at the moment for uh, uh, pilots and air crew that uh, fly at high altitudes and high longitudes or latitudes. Anyway, um, whichever it is higher up in the uh, on the Earth, uh, they're getting more cosmic rays. Yeah. Well, Martin, you've been very quiet because all the others have uh, had quite quite a say about this. But I'm looking at this and thinking I would I wouldn't want to do as an astronaut more than 200 days in space. I'd be bored, Bridget. Oh hell no! I mean, I'm I'm not even going to pretend that I understand this. Cosmic rays to me sounds like something like an '80s cartoon um, weapon or something like this. Um, yeah, it could limit deep space missions for uh, astronauts. Like I, <laughs> I get homesick after two or three weeks. <laughs> two hundred days is like you've got to be, you know, you've got to be a special kind of person to to be able to do that sort of stuff. But you know, will it mean better conditions for HF for us? That's that's what I'm really interested in. I saw, you know, another news story mentioning all sorts of, you know, solar storms and things like that. I mean, you know, if this is related, then, you know, it could be good news for, for us amateurs, you know, with the greatest respect to the astronauts, the fact that, that, that they that they can't go to work for more than 200 days at a time. Well, you know, have a look at what's happening down here on Earth. Many of us can't go to work at the moment. So <laughs> if you can get there for 200 days, then go you. Yeah. Uh, the the other thing on that is, as we're talking about going to Mars or, or 
not we, yeah. but uh, certain people talking about going to Mars. Does Mars have protection protection with an atmosphere? I don't think it does, does it? So what happens there with the cosmic rays? And the cosmic rays always makes me think of the 1960s and psychedelic parties and things. I'm not sure why. The, the 200 and some days matters because it takes about um, nine months to get to Mars based right. on current propulsion. And so you're going to be irradiated the whole time you're on your way over. Um, Mars does have an atmosphere and a very weak magnetic field. So I would have to look it up. I, I, I know I know at one point I read about the there's no there's no ionosphere, so to say, that we're used to. Hit conditions are out on Mars then. Correct. So HF radio would not bounce off anything. It would just go out into space like it's VHF, which is could interesting, you know. That could be interesting. But so the protection from the atmosphere on Mars will be lower. So, you know, you you're, you're, you get you get there in like nine months. You can only stay a few months, and then it's nine months to get back. That's way past that 260 days. So I think that's why this, this end is going to end up mattering, because I, I, I do know that there is a lot of chatter in the various um, uh, magazines and websites I read about gearing up technology and processes to actually attempt a Mars mission in the next, you know, decade or so. And there's a, there's some, there's some serious technical challenges they need to overcome with, with shielding, especially, um, because once you're not shielded there, you know, it, it could end up being a one way trip. And I don't think anybody really wants to go through that. That's clearly been the plans from NASA's end bill for a decade it's a one-way trip now they may have changed that but but again that that was clearly the plan yeah i I just find that hard to believe (laughs) well i worked i worked for nasa at the time and and my direct boss was a guy named bob alton kirk and he was on the planning team with nasa so i mean that's that's my source of information no, I believe you because I read that as well. Uh, not not that many years ago, that, that was the plan. I just didn't believe it. <laughs> I just don't, I don't. I don't know why. It just seems like you know. What, why would you send them on a one way mission? <laughs> but it makes sense from a technical point of view. Wasn't there a private company looking for volunteers to to do the the one way trip to Mars as well? I believe. Same about maybe five, know, five or ten years ago. They were looking for people to put their names down to go to Mars and never come back. Uh, I I believe that's yes. I, I vaguely remember that as well. Well, I think while we on this one, we maybe ought to uh, not be quite so morbid. I'm just going to throw something in because Frank and I'll understand this because we were around in the sixties, weren't we, Frank? But yes, hey, we were. we were, yeah. So I'm I'm saying that there's probably a load of. Um, hippies that are reading this going cosmic rays man <laughs> i'm being very happy without understanding what it's all about that is farm out <laughs> whoa man the rays are getting to me man yeah so okay i i'm just trying to light me up at the end here but yeah it, it's an interesting uh story and uh, going forward moving to our next news story radio hams assist teams on the ground in contacting uh, people and this is in india this is when they're looking for people that need to isolate due to covid and it's just interesting that uh, in india they do a lot of work on this um, it's a bit like our raynet or aries in the states but they don't seem to have the the opposition to doing this do they frank uh, no, and uh, as as I mentioned in our pre-recording, one of the cool things about this story, particularly for the UK, perhaps Europe, I'm I'm just ignorant. Ed may know much more about that. I'm sure he does. Uh, or the US, when you have fairly developed countries, you get formal. You get formal about a lot of volunteer things. You know, over here in the states with Aries. We have so many courses you got to go through, so many. You have to have a ring-bound notebook to show up and do an official 
thing with an emergency management group that's regulated by Homeland Security. In less developed countries, and we've covered, I don't know, at least three or four stories, uh, particularly from the Pacific, uh, Pacific Rim in general, less developed countries, hams just kind of bring what they have, just like the next person does. Uh, someone may have a tractor. Well, hey, I got a tractor. I know how to use it. I can bring it. We'll do it. Well, I'm a ham. I got communication. I know how to do it. So to me, this is an organically uh, organized, you know, type of thing. But the folks in the hams in India seem to have become quite proficient in it. So I, I think it's a real positive thing because what happens in in chaos, as we saw 15 years ago with Katrina, the hurricane that hit New Orleans. All the best laid plans, uh, you know, go. So, yeah, we have to be flexible, and I think they are probably more flexible be- because they are not uh, restricted like the rest of us. Martin, what's your thoughts? Well, it's nice to see the hams ham- helping out, which is always a good thing. You know, we all like to get involved. We all like to do things. Obviously, with 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 things like contact tracing and things, there is there is obviously going to be a risk to some extent. But I've got to ask why. Why do we need this? Why does they need the hams assistance to do this? Because, you know, I, I get it in, you know, places where you have hurricanes and you have bad weather and things like that that takes out the cell towers, it takes out the, the, the fiber optic cables and things like that, and they bring the networks down. And therefore, the only way to get the signals out is over the air. I get it. In, you know, we talk about this in, in India. India's got, my understanding, um, you know, pretty good mobile phone networks. It's not like those networks are down. Surely it would be easier to send things out, you know, by by bulk messages to people's phones if they need to to send things out to more than one person at once. What am I missing here? I guess it depends. India is an absolutely massive country, and uh, I do know that it's pretty advanced technology wise. We have a lot of people that work for where I work from India that are really really good at IT. But it's a massive country and, and hugely diverse. So I'm guessing this, I don't, I don't know India itself particularly well. I don't know which area or which region of India this covers. But you know, I'm guessing there are some areas that have better communication infrastructure than others. And I'm wondering if the, the, where they're helping out here is perhaps the areas where perhaps they haven't got that level of, of, of infrastructure in place. So perhaps they're having to rely on, on, on ham radio to, or amateur radio to, uh, to fill that gap. Well, out in the hinterlands, it's a dramatically different world than in the big cities. I think that's part of it, Chris. And I think the other thing that backs that up is the fact of the the people who are hams in India are actually already uh, are actually well respected in their own communities, and they are trusted. We see story after story about hams helping in areas where you say, "Well, why don't the police do that?" Well. Quite often now in the country, they haven't got the the manpower, um, but the amateurs are the people that are actually trusted because they are, you know, the volunteers and the volunteer arrangers. Whether this particular story here even involves radio isn't actually relevant. Uh, it's actually more the fact that it's it's feet on the ground and that they can help work with the government, work with the police to trace contacts that people have had once somebody is found to have COVID-19. And I heard of stories where, in certain places, the police station is closed at the weekend. They only work Monday to Friday. And in an emergency, they go to the local radio amateur in the village. So the very, especially in the countryside, uh, radio hams in, in India are actually very well respected and trusted. Can I raise another another point? I think that was a good point from from, uh, from Ed there. Personal data. So this sort of thing I don't think we allowed in the UK or certainly in Europe because the one assumes that they're having to pass information about people over the air. And that sort of thing I'm pretty sure would not be allowed for data protection reasons. And I think that's one of the one of the constraints around emergency emergency communications in general is that you are sometimes having to pass personal information. That's Obviously, amateur radio is not, we're not allowed to encrypt it. We're not allowed to sort of, you know, put any sort of cipher. We're having to send that in plain text, and you know, in, not text, but you know, in plain voice or, or code, and um, if anybody can hear. So we got a little bit careful. So I don't know what the rules are in India, but that's certainly a consideration. Yeah. Well, I was going to say 
is that, and I'll pass it to Bill in a second, and you can comment on whether I'm right or wrong, Bill. India, a massive, a much bigger country than the UK, physical size. The States, massive compared with the UK in size. Australia, bigger than the, state, the UK in size. In the UK, we're very fortunate because we're a small country. Putting infrastructure in, like the mobile phone networks, there's, there's a lot more cost benefit analysis because you've got more people, uh, you've got a smaller area and, uh, and are more densely populated. Now, I noticed when I went to the States, and there's nothing against the States, there were areas where the mobile phone didn't work. Uh, now, in a rural society, uh, rural areas, yeah, you're not going, they're not going to put a cell tower in for three people. Um, am I right, Bill? Yeah, that is, that is accurate. In fact, I could tell you in painful detail as, cause we're dealing with this right now. Uh, you drive 15 minutes north or south off Interstate 80 where we're at and you're going to hit spots that may or may not have cell coverage unless you're on a hilltop. You get down in these little crevices and valleys and, uh, um, for, you know, in a lot of cases, forget it. Um, in fact, I'm, you know, running into that issue of some students that are trying to learn from home that do not have access to DSL or cable modems or fiber or cell phones. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's very fascinating, um, and disturbing because, uh, uh, it's, it's definitely a digital divide, but in reference to this story as well, I mean, the only other thing I have to add is, is that I, kudos on these, on these folks, um, their community needed help. They stepped up and they helped. It's, it, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And the fact that they're able to help lend any assistance at this point to any group is, is, is just amazing and wonderful. And I love that. And then finally, the only other thing I want to point out is transmitting patient data um, over the air unencrypted. The workaround that I've seen happen in various articles, not only in the States, but, but other countries, has been they would transmit a uh, tag number with a, you know, get ready for, for them to come in. So tag five has, um, you know, substantial burns due to fire and then the person that comes through the door is tagged with a number that's the workaround but that's that's kind of crude but that's that's what i have seen in the past to get around the the, the passing of medical data unencrypted organization essentially yeah and all this stuff i mean it, it depends on the disaster i mean if the internet's available they're not sending stuff over radio anyway so it just really depends. Yeah. Well, as I said, the uh, it's a good news story from India. There are some really good reasons why they can do it and we can't uh, in, in more developed countries because our infrastructure and our licensing says we can't, obviously. But uh, I still think in an emergency, get the information through. Moving on. Once again, this is an emergency uh, type story. It's the International Air Ambulance Week uh, in 2020 happening on the 5th to the 13th of September. So you've got a couple of weeks at the moment. And these guys run the air ambulances in the UK, helicopters to get uh, people to hospital in an emergency. But there are special event stations on. And if you work any of these special event stations, you could end up with an award, which uh, I think is probably a nice thing to have in your shack. Now, Bill, I know it's not a contest. I'm going to go back to you first on this one. Any chance of you working these, do you reckon? It really depends on the propagation. This is a special event for the 6th International Air Ambulance Week for 2020. It's from September 5th to September 13th. Clubs and folks that want to activate an air ambulance have a uh, registration form to fill out so that people know you're going to be there. But 
case in point is this, you know, there's three stations already set up that are out there and they're planning on doing HF via VHF. And, you know, the one group's going to do PSK, another group's going to do CW, another group's going to do digital. And so there's, um, it gives you the call signs and, oh, M0 MNG. That sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just re- recognize the call sign on that. He'll list. be out there. Don't you worry. He'll be out there. Any sniff of a, a special event, Edmund will be there. And he's going to be in uh, Grid Square IO 90ST. So I'm going to give him props. Um, I tried to work him on, the, I tried to listen for him on the, the Lighthouse weekend, by the way. Um, so maybe we'll have a little bit better, better luck during International Air Ambulance Week. But there is an award. Um, you get five stations, you can get a bronze award. You work, you know, 10 stations, you get the silver. You work 15, you can get a gold award. And it's just another nice thing I think will be really neat to uh, hang on your shack wall. I agree with you totally, Bill. Agree with you totally. Chris, your thoughts on this one? Well, it's a good one. There are 72, looking at the website now, there are 72 registered stations that will be on the air at some point during that weekend, one of which is our Edmund. So, forward to um to working him um we were planning to actually do one ourselves and forward so we, we we operate our there's a, an event every year called this is ssb field Day contest that as a club we enter we actually use a field or we've been allowed to use a field for the last few years at uh, an airfield um it's obviously not the runway or anything it's it's a field next to you know nearby but it's obviously not on the uh near to the aircraft and uh, it happens to be that at the airfield where the Kent, sorry, or one of the Kent, sorry, and Sussex their ambulances is based on, maybe a couple of them, we did see them flying over a few times. And um, I don't think they're actually based at a few airfields, but we were planning to uh, to perhaps go back there the week after, which is the week when this event takes place, to um, to, to, to put on ourselves. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we ended up not doing it. But um, I was just looking at the website, actually, for that. There's lots of independent air ambulance groups in the UK. Uh, which are, I believe, either wholly or mainly funded by the public, not through taxpayer you know, funding. And um, it's amazing. So the the the, the one for um, Kent, Surrey, and Sussex, which is kind of our sort of area in the UK, it costs fourteen million pounds a year to run. So it is not a cheap, not a cheap thing. And they do, you know, a lot of good work and live a lot of lives. So uh, I would absolutely say let's support these guys and. Um, it gives a little bit of extra funding, a bit of extra publicity, then that's, that's a great thing. And in fact, we've got 70, 72 stations that are uh, going to be on the air. Um, you know, let's work as well as you can. Let's get some of those awards. And, uh, and while you're at it, perhaps put a few pennies in the in the, uh, in the bucket to um, to help out. In fact, looking at this list, they aren't all in the UK. We've got one in Texas, one in Jacksonville. So they aren't just, uh, you know, this is the international in Ambulance Week, and uh, there's quite a lot of them in the UK, but there's quite a few ones that are, you know, one in India, I can see there, and, and uh, one in Fremantle in um, is that Australia. So, um, yeah. so yeah, yeah it's um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's 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 now pretty international, which is great. Well, actually, in Haiti, so uh, you know, it's not just a UK thing. So yeah, you may well find wherever you are, listen out, and you may hear some uh, some uh, special event stations on the air um, that weekend or that week. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. Ed, your thoughts on this one? Uh, just to echo what I said, uh, there are air ambulances in uh, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, France, etc. as well, although they're not listed uh, in this event. And as far as I know, they're also not government funded. They're all funded through donations. Certainly the, the Alpine ones, many of the Alpine ones are. So. Uh, in, no matter what country you're in, if there's an emergency helicopter ambulance organization, throw them a few, uh, a few uh, dollars, shekels, euros, pounds, whatever, and, uh, and support them. Uh, if you can get on the air and talk to uh, any of the special event stations that are going to be on, all the better, and uh, publicize uh, the the air ambulance service whatever country it's in yeah sounds good to me now mine you're working from home at the moment are you gonna have a sneaky listen 
of, of, of course you know i'm sitting here at the moment yeah i'm, I'm doing my work but i've got my, my radios next to me i'm uh spending a lot of time tuning around and having a listen but i will just say uh you know bill, bill mentioned he was trying to work edmund uh, on the lighthouse weekend we did hear edmund and we worked him albeit we were 100 yards apart and on two meters but that's neither here nor there but with um reference to the uh, the air ambulance well I, I actually sat in an air ambulance once when they first uh, brought the one out for um for surrey um my school was actually next to an ambulance station and they wanted to see it and see what was on board and the ambulance station didn't have a field and my school did and the agreement that they struck with the school was that yes you can land a helicopter in our field and you can bring the ambulance staff through and they can see it and have a talk about it but you've got to let us see it as well we've got to be allowed to sit in it and you've got to give us a talk about it as well albeit a much more dumbed down talk for primary school kids but uh, that was the the hems helicopter back in the day sponsored i think at the time by the daily express other brands are available but yeah air ambulances they they're not go- certainly in the uk they're not government funded they're all charities and helicopters i think as as chris mentioned cost a hell of a lot to run and that's before you throw in the cost of the paramedics that you know operate them and, and work on board plus the the, the, the pilot and things so uh, anything here to raise their publicity that's got to be a good thing although um us hams we don't like party with our money um we like free stuff but uh hey you know as, as as ed mentioned you know if you can it's a charity one day you might need we hope you don't but one day you might need an air ambulance so uh you know if you can put a couple of uh, whatever into the bucket then i'm sure that'll be appreciated and uh, of course there are um opportunities to get awards so it's a great excuse to uh, get yourself on the air and if it raises publicity for your ambulances and their lack of central funding, then it's got to be a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Certainly, certainly has. Now, Frank, um, unfortunately, you got last on this one. There are some in the States, as I've just been told. But what's your thoughts on the whole uh, scenario? Well, there are many in the States, and uh, some are have public support. For example, the University of Mississippi med center medical school here in jackson has a critical care transport home they do adults they do children neonatal pediatric they have a staff of 35 who work only in in that unit now they serve the state as a whole i'm just ignorant about how the costing is done i do know the state puts money into that but I suspect that for the individual patient, there's also an insurance claim and that sort of thing. I, I listen to them on my scanner system, and I unfortunately uh, frequently hear them uh, in that sense. So there are some public ones, and there's also commercial ones, the Mississippi Air Ambulance Service, for example. And, and you, you get a quote, just like you want a quote to you know get a new roof on your house or something. And so there's a variety of them just here in Mississippi. Uh, nationally, I think it varies a fair amount, you know, but I'm, I'm delighted with what is going on with this particular event. Not surprised at all that Edmund Spicer uh, is already registered to be an operator. And so I'll certainly look at making some contribution to it. Because when it comes down to it, yeah, some people don't want to pay on, for roads they don't drive on. But then you'd never be able to get there if somebody didn't pay to have a road to start with. And I think this is like that when you're on the line, you got to get it done first and then, and then figuring out long term how to pay for it. So this is a great, great program. Yeah, I would say I think this is a great event. Amateur radio publicizing the air ambulance, international air ambulances. And there's a lot we can do to promote and in fairness if uh, people see amateur radio operators near airfields or whatever they'll come over and ask us what we're doing it's all promotion which is good and uh, once again the, the, if you work them and you work enough of them you can get a nice award so that's that's good moving on to our next new story how radio exams in the u.s during the pandemic uh, it looks like they're doing okay there in Hawaii, Frank. Um, I'll let you go first on this one. But um, what do you think? Because uh, we rolled the two news stories together, but Hawaii first. 
Well, uh, Joe Speroni, uh, AH0A, whom I've had some interactions with on some of the FCC licensing information, he's an expert on that as well. Uh, he's a VE team leader and uh, section manager for Hawaii and, and the islands there. They're doing great. you got to keep in mind, not to take anything away from that, but they're kind of a small entity, not as large as the United Kingdom. We've covered in the past how just shockingly at, at the time, the UK's had just a really, really good program to test, uh, educate and test remotely. So uh, I just think it's wonderful. That doesn't surprise me. I'll wait until Ed Ed uh, has a comment about uh, the, the licensure bit. Okay, well, let's pass it over to Ed then, uh, because there's a secondary part of this story about the um, US and licensing. How are you, Ed? Yeah. Um... The ARRL volunteer examiner, I guess coordinator, AB1FM, has said that the testing has been down 15% compared to last year and the number of new licenses down by 12%. Now, you might say, well, yeah, with the COVID and everything else, that's not surprising and they're doing pretty well to be only down that far. But then at the same time in the UK, They've been hitting, you've been hitting record numbers of getting a lot more people licensed because during the lockdown, people have said, oh, I'll get around to taking my amateur radio license at last. I just wonder why we're seeing something different in the US to the UK. And uh, before we started this recording, uh, I think it was either. Um, Bill or Frank was saying that you know, the environment and the setup there is in fact different uh, to what's happened in the UK with the train, the online training and the online examinations. Even though the online examinations became available earlier in the US than in the UK, it seems the UK system's taken off and the US one is having some kind of problems. I've got a perspective here. So I've taken, and as has Martin, taken taken both the UK and the US exams. And I think this is, it comes down to what the difference is between the normal, shall we say, non-COVID world of taking the exams and this this new online way of doing things. So in the UK, under the kind of normal operating scheme, shall we say, you pretty much have got to take a, a, a course to take the exam. So certainly, um, myself and Martin and and and, and the other Martin as well actually are instructors, and, and and when we take when we do a course at the end of the course, you take the exam. That's quite a commitment. You need to book it. You need to plan it. You need to find someone that's doing the doing the um, the course. And there aren't that many per year. We we do once a year. So it's quite a it's quite an effort to actually bother to actually take the exam. Now suddenly the RSGB have announced. Two things. One is, and actually, sorry, one of the reasons, by the way, you have to do the course is because, and technically you don't have to do the course, but it's difficult to do it without it because you have to do practicals as well as the well as the actual exam. There's also a number of practical elements where you have to, you know, do things like, for example, with the intermediate course, it's a plug so onto, you know, uh, on a, on, you know, onto a wire, onto a cable. Um, you need to tune an aerial, that sort of thing. Now, what they've done is that the, the things that have changed in the UK during lockdown is they've done away with the practicals. And you can do the exams online. So you no longer have to actually go away and, and go through a formal course. You can pretty much go online, book the exam and take it. Okay, you might have to wait a few weeks to avoid taking the exam. I know it's a waiting list, but it, the accessibility is much greater. Now, I think in the US, my experience of that was you can just turn up and take the exam. You can just go away, read the book, go, go on. I want to the book, for example, learn the, uh, learn the material. Um, you'll see advertised um, clubs just doing the exam, not the full course, just the exam. Um, you turn up, take the exam, and you've got your license. So I think this just become a lot more accessible in the UK, and therefore I think it's become much more attractive to people in the UK just to go away and just turn up and take the exam rather than before having to sort of uh, do a lot more work to, to, get, to, to get your license. not work in terms of kind of learning more and more in terms of just the administration I suppose around it and, and that sort of thing. I mean we can just do what Mr. Butler thinks as well. That's that's kind of my, my, my take on the way things have changed in the UK. I, w- I would just say one thing is that we talk about, you know, why is things different in the US to the UK? 
um, you know, initially, well, you know, maybe the group that are organizing these in the, in the two different countries need to start talking to each other and working together. But I wonder, are we able to do more in the UK? Because the people that are making the rules on what you have to do for the course can and have the power to just change things ad hoc. So at the moment you say, okay, well, we can't do the practicals because of the whole global situation. Therefore, we're going to remove that and we're going to offer online training because they have the power to do that. Whereas perhaps in the US, is there more red tape? Do you need to get approval from the FCC or from the AR or whoever uh, in order to be able to do that? Is that perhaps why they're not so, from what I heard, and this I can't really tell me this now, so this may not be true, but from what I heard, um, the need for practicals was not something that was mandated by Ofcom. That's the reason it was quite easy to drop them. So maybe that's the situation then. Maybe that's why they've been able to do that. And maybe maybe there is something that, that is mandated by the FCC, the you know, ARRL or whoever is, I don't want to say it's the ARRL, but whoever's making the exams and doing the exams in the US, maybe that's something that they don't have the power to change. Yeah, I think I think what I'm saying is it was it's always it's always been easy in the state to book and take the exam. It's not been too easy in the UK until lockdown. I think that's the reason why we're suddenly seeing a lot of people doing it because it's suddenly a lot more convenient, shall we say? I'm not saying it's easier, but it's certainly a lot more convenient now to, to book it and take the exam. It's become easier in the UK. It's always been easy in the US. In the US, yeah. there is the additional demand, which there perhaps is in the UK, who have seen things go out on social media and said, "Oh, I can do that. Yes, I'm going to sign up to that now." As opposed to in the US, well, well, I could have just done that anyway. That's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Let's clarify that, Martin. It's easier to book an exam in the US. Uh, I wouldn't say the exam is easier. In fact, in some ways, it's more difficult. And, but and in, in full, full, you know, as far as you know, from my point of view, just to clarify, I've not done the US exam. I've not seen it, so I can't know how easy the exam is. I'm just referring to you know being able to book it. Okay, when I took mine in the UK, uh, I turned up. I sat in a room. I did my technician. I passed that. The guy said. Oh, you can take your general now. Now, in the UK, I, I would not have been allowed to do that. I'd have had to book another exam date at some other time in the future. Uh, I, I passed the general, and they said to me, right, you can take your extra now, or your advanced, or whatever it is. I'm sorry, Bill, I've forgotten, but extra. Is is extra. And take your extra. And I took the extra. Now, the the thing is, I would have had to book three uh, exam sessions in the UK to do that. But that's another story. Are we keeping Bill out in the cold? Bill, you said that there may be a reason in that uh, it's just labor intensive. Yes. Um, I've been sitting here anxiously waiting to jump in. <laughs> I can't talk about the, the your side of the pond on the, on the Brits, but I can talk pretty deeply and, and, and so can Frank because we're intimately familiar with at least some of the of the volunteer examiner groups so a volunteer examiner coordinator is an organization that has been approved by the fcc to administer amateur radio license exams in the united states i vaguely remember there's like 14 of them i'm i'm actually still a ve for uh, the arls uh, testing sessions bunch of my friends are in the W5YI group. They're also in, some of them are in the one they call Laurel VE. The nice one thing about the Laurel one is they don't charge exams fees. ARRL charges to recoup costs on, you know, creation of the exam. So that's, that's the background on, on the state side. So the other interesting thing and I say this, it's interesting because I, I have, a, I have a, a, a job where I'm frequently introduced to online learning technologies because I have to help people get, get stuff to work on that sometimes. We have a published question pool over here. So that means all the questions are known along with the correct and not correct answers. This is like begging just immediately begging to be loaded into a uh, a learning management system as a quit as an exam that could be run by any of these volunteer examiner coordinator groups 
um, and you just say, okay, the, the, the technician requires so many questions from this pool, from this part of the pool, so many questions on this question on RF safety. Um, and it would just randomly generate your exam for you and you could take it online. I'm unaware of anyone that's even trying to do that. So I have one friend who has been helping with exams. They are, they need three VEs to give an exam and they're doing it over a video conferencing program. Um, in this particular case, the one I'm aware of is they were doing a Zoom session. Um, and the three VEs watch the person taking the exam. Now, the, the interesting thing from the, from the article that we, you shared with us was the Hawaii group figured out that they can watch three people take exams. So at least they get three people through. Um, but that's pretty, pretty labor intensive the way they implemented it. Cause I, I you know, <laughs> because the question pools are published, um, people like Dan, KB6NU writes, you know, great training manuals that you can go through and, and, and you can learn the stuff you need to pass your exam very, very, very easily on your own just by reading the book and, and understanding what, what what's presented there because they are the questions. Um, he does them as a, a narrative to kind of explain why this is the only correct answer. The other one I'm aware of is the local one of the local non-clubs. You know, we talk about clubs and hubs. Um, I'm starting to call them a hub. We have a non, they call themselves a non-club. Um, Central Susquehanna Technical Group started up their uh, VE sessions again, actually not too terribly far from my house, um, 10 or 15 minute ride, you know, up, up into Fox Nancy 11 for those that, that, that collect grid squares. And they actually found a facility that would let them have a Saturday exam session that's socially distanced. So they uh, they had all the desks split. It looks like on well, the Facebook photo. It looked like they had to everybody masked up and separated, you know, by a good six foot. And and they had they got three new hams through that way, but with an in person um, exam. And actually, I, I used to work with one of the VEs. I just I just recognized his call sign. That's kind of interesting, but um. I think that is part of the of the problem. And the other part is right off the bat, we did a story a couple months ago. I think Frank remembers it about um, the FCC had to come out and clarify that, yes, you are allowed to do exams remotely because I guess some of the groups were not convinced that they were allowed to administer exams remotely. So I think it's getting a little better. Um, I think we're going to get some more folks in into the hobby or get, get them upgraded. But in general, I think it's just the uh, nature of the of the of what we're going through right now. That on your side of the pond, people that were kind of holding off on, uh, you know, thinking about getting going to take a course and do their exams, all of a sudden saw the online option and thought, "I'll jump on this now." And on this side of the of the of the, of the, of the pond, the folks you know that were just like, yeah, "I'll just wait until." Uh, Things are back to whatever normal is going to be like, and then I'll just go sit for a test session, you know, take a little more time to read the books. Um, that's just a guess. I'm not sure about that part, but that that's kind of what, what the numbers suggest to me if I were to make a uh, uh, guess based on, um, you know, where we're at in the year and where we expect for folks to join the hobby or, or upgrade. Well, Bill. I had a chat with um, one of our new foundation license holders the other day on a local repeater while I was driving home. And he was, um, I would suggest the guy must have been mid 40s. Uh, from, from, he didn't tell me his age, but from things he was talking about in life, probably mid 40s, he'd uh, been around radio in a commercial environment uh you know but he'd not been an amateur before now a local m7 and he was uh, you know, we were discussing various bits and pieces and i understand why we're not doing the practicals i think they're very very good things and i think that you know people who pass the foundation in the uk would certainly get a lot of help from doing the practicals and maybe clubs should be offering this after lockdown 
But without taking a hose and damping the bonfire down, yeah, we've got in excess of a thousand people who have just passed their, their intermediate, uh, sorry, their foundation license. That's one number. I'm going to ask the question very slowly, and I don't expect mega answers from this because I don't know. But whenever I'm sure every one of us here, when we first passed our license, were tongue tied. Out of the thousand people that got a license, how many of them have gone on air? How many of them have had the confidence to pick up a microphone and go on air? How many of them are still? guessing what shall I buy? You know, you could have a thousand new licenses, but it could be something as low as about fifty new people on the air. I was gonna say I think that's where clubs come in. I think clubs should now be reaching out. I think you know I think there's a lot of people out there that have got lots of we just got a license that are gonna really fight up and really want to get on the air and really want to, you know, do something with this hobby and it's very exciting and probably very you know, really want to do something with this new license they've got. But they are going to need a little bit of help. And there is social media, Facebook groups, that sort of thing, is, and, you know, and that's eight people that you might know. But, I mean, this is really where clubs can come into their own. People can come along, they can play with Kate, they can have a little practice on the air, they can get advice, they can talk to people a bit more experienced, um, rather than going to the nearest amateur radio shop and band behind the counter rubbing his hands saying, I'll sign one of these, and, you know, that's not really knowing what they're buying. So I think there is... Um, I think this is where clubs can really, really come in, come into their own. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, Balfang take a, a really good kick in both sides of the pond at times, but I've come across one or two radios that make the Balfang look an absolute dream to use. So in fairness, you know, if you buy something like that, then you could put the person off the hobby. Anyway, we could go on on this for ages, so I'm going to move on to the next new story. Ed, I'm going to get you to do this one first because it's a German story. Uh, but uh, a German radio amateur falsely accused in Greece of being a spy. What did he do wrong, Ed? Well, common sense says if you're going to go to a country where the language is not your own, the documents are written differently and a country where it's known that it's good to have documentation with you for anything and everything, I would take a copy of my radio license and a translation into the local language. I would take a copy of the uh, CEPT regulations that say I am allowed to transmit uh, in that country and again translated into the local language if possible, at least in the three uh, general languages used in the EEC of English, French and German. Uh, what happened here is this uh, 51-year-old uh, German national, who we don't have the name or the call sign from, uh, has gone to Greece and particularly into an area where there is political tension with Turkey so uh, the police and the military there are uh, on edge in any case. And he's been there using his radio from his car. And then when the police have come along and said, what are you doing? Uh, they've actually arrested him because uh, he's, he, all he could do there was say was, well, I am legal. I have got the right to this. Um, but. Uh, whether it was lost in translation or whether he did not have translated documents with him, either way, the local policeman that uh, arrested him put him in jail and let him uh, stand before the court the next day. Now, as it turns out, the court let him go, but um, it's probably a good warning for anybody. If you go into a country where they don't speak your language, um, then take your documentation in their language. Uh, to make sure that uh, you avoid this problem. If the policeman had had the documentation given to him in Greek, um, he probably would then have simply called his central office that said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay, it looks okay, no worries. And this gentleman would have been sent on his way with a, with a happy smile. As it turned out, he wasn't prepared. The uh, policeman probably has never met an amateur radio enthusiast before. And uh, in an area where 
there's a lot of tension, so a political tension. Uh, so uh, this uh, German amateur got uh, charged, but then let off for being a spy. Rather worrying that, that um, there seems to be lots of things have happened in the past uh, going to Greece, as Chris, uh, you'll confirm. But uh, this was Rhodes. I've never been to Rhodes, so I yeah. can't uh, comment on that. What do you think, Chris? Well, this did ring a bell. So there is history. So back in, I was Googling actually, back in 2001, that a bunch of British um, plane spotters that were held in Greece on spying charges. They've been to they've been to a um, military air show um, in southern Greece, and uh, they they were charged with with spying then. And uh, I think in the end, it uh, they ended up getting released. But uh, it took a, it took a while actually. I think it took a while to get their convictions overturned, and it was a. It, you know, it was a pretty serious thing at the time. I think it was quite, a, you know, a lot of diplomacy required to get them out. They could have got, they could have had twenty years in prison for this. So, uh, but yeah, that was I can't believe that was nineteen years ago. That was uh, so. Yes, there's definitely um, we need to be a bit, we need to, as, as um, Ed was saying, to be a little bit careful. Um, what may be perfectly normal and you know, when your home country, you know, may be viewed in a different way elsewhere. So you need to be careful and have the appropriate. Uh, documents to hand to um to, to provide so uh you know it sounds like on this occasion eventually the right thing was done but um yeah there are certain parts of the world where some of the radio can be viewed with a lot of suspicion yeah i think you have to do your homework though if you're going to operate abroad you've got to do your homework i mean there are i go to cyprus quite regularly there are places in cyprus through which i wouldn't take a radio anywhere near and I remember a guy saying, you didn't see that golf ball over there. That doesn't exist. Fine. I, I, I think. But even, even the British, even the British base, when you go to Cyprus uh, on the Greek side, you can operate as 5B. But there's a couple of British bases there and you ain't allowed to operate on those uh, military bases. You can drive through them, but you're not allowed to operate. Now, you would think because they're British territory, practically the, the military base, you'd be able to use your M or G call sign. The answer is no. So it is a matter of you've got to do your homework before you go. Mine, what's your thoughts? Well, I was just thinking I got stopped in the UK for using my radio in the car years ago when I first got licensed. And the uh, police officer had no idea what I was doing. And, you know, despite having my license with me, took them a long time to decide but eventually they said okay yeah no problem they were concerned about like a single you know three foot whip on the roof of the car the fact that you know there's all ups and downs and there was a, a big satellite dish on the roof of someone's car down there that was doing microwaves is, is neither here nor there but i showed the slip that they gave me this lot the stop and search type slip uh to another friend of mine who was a police officer who just looked at it laughed and then said you can go and take the mick out of the people that uh stopped me the following day as well as uh educating them but uh to me, you know, political unrest aside, in Greece, I mean, I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought of, uh, of Rhodes of being a, a place I would have needed to have additional documentation, but clearly it is. Initially, it seems like a lack of education on the police's part, although common sense um, does dictate if you're going to go abroad, you know, even if you are just taking a handheld, you know, as, as, as Ed said, take your license, take documentation of what you're doing and take it in a language that they will understand, that they can call for backup and say, look, what the hell is this guy doing? And then, you know, they can, you know, their base can say, oh, yeah, that's legal. Um, I like the comment on the end of this, though. The, uh, the court wondered what kind, of vacant, uh, what kind of vacation this was, but considered there was not enough evidence for the nature of the offence. Well, before he got arrested, it sounds like quite a fun vacation. After that, um, yeah, I bet his wife was pleased. Yeah, I'm sure that the family would have been most upset with it. Now... In fairness, we've talked about you got to do this, and I'm going to move over to the guys in the States. But I believe, and I know it was like nearly 10 years ago I took my, my American license, but I am supposed to carry a copy of my American license in my wallet. There's a, there's, when, you, when you print your um, license from the FCC, there's a a bit that you can stick on the wall, and there's a bit that you're supposed to cut up and put in your wallet. Now, I took that, but I also printed out a whole 
uh, sheet with the, the full license on it and various bits and pieces and my UK license when I went to the States. Called it overkill, but it was as much as anything to uh, make sure that um, airport security knew what I was carrying through. Was that a good idea or not, Frank? Well, it, it probably was uh, for you to do it overkill rather than underkill. But, you know, Martin, I've been under, under a lot of stress here listening to this story. And I'm going to have to make a stunning admission. I, I've been working with an agent from MI6 uh, named Edmund Spicer, and I loaned him my secret spy radio, my FT-891, when he came over to the States. And I heard him using all these funny ciphered codes like C and Q and QRZ, and he was talking in this strange language to these other people far away. And I just can't take it anymore. Yes, I have <laughs> committed spying with the United Kingdom in my six. And I hate to turn in my friend Edmund Spicer, but he did it. I have seen Edmund in the, in the Dickie Bird, so I, I, I now, must be, must be, yes. But that's in jest, obviously. But if you're not a ham, that's not a great leap, uh, if you will, for, for someone, particularly as some of the other commenters have said, it's, you know, as, there's a lot of tension about a lot of things. So uh, it's commonplace for us. And, and uh, Martin, you're spot on to, with what you said, be prepared. I, I think Ed said carried in a, a local language. But, but I've got a, a serious question for Ed, who uh, is a soda activator. Ed, has anybody activated Mount Olympus in Cyprus? Uh, the Cyprus expert is uh, is Martin here. Um, okay. I, I don't know. I think so, but I'm not sure because uh, is is Mount, excuse my ignorance here, but is, is Mount Olympus uh, an extinct volcano? Uh, I've been there. I have operated from Mount Olympus, the Greek side, uh, and you pretty much walk around the Greek side and... If I'm being brutally honest, I, uh, knowing what's up there, I wouldn't uh, take radio equipment again there. There is actually anybody who does geocaching, there are 19 geocaches in a, in a ring around the top of Mount Olympus. And you walk around this um, track and do the geocaching. Uh, the biggest pain is that... Um, as you go around the, the Turkish side, your mobile phone logs onto the Turkish network and then they say you've been out of the country, you've, you've operated in two countries on your phone. It's another thing. And often uh, often phone companies don't recognize uh, the Cypriot part, or the Turkish Cypriot part. That'd but, be a heck of a QSL card from Mount Olympus. Yeah, yeah. I've worked people uh, from Mount Limus down down Limassol on two meters because you you you're you're a long way up. You're about uh, ten thousand feet, so you're a long way up. It's line of sight. I've worked people down into um, Limassol from there, but it's probably knowing what I know now and being a bit more educated, I probably wouldn't take a radio to that area. I'm just looking actually now on the SOTA website. There are 48 summits in Cyprus. Uh, I don't think Mount Olympus is one of them. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Mount is one of them. However, even if it's written in a language that I don't necessarily understand, it could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think we've left Bill out in the cold again. Sorry, Bill. Bill. It's all good. I'm on the SOTA website looking at, looking at the 48 summits too, so don't feel bad. Um, and there's there's some activations there, seven, five, three, one, one, couple unactivated, a couple ten pointers not activated. They're probably in restricted areas. But you know, back to the original story, there's there's stuff that doesn't add up with this. I mean, I uh, I keep documentation in my soda backpack, and I'm hiking local mountains where I probably know most of the folks that come up and, and question you from law enforcement. Um, so it's, uh, and I still keep documentation, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure about this. Okay, moving on to our last news story. I like this one, and Chris came across this. Mark Haynes, 
M0 GXR, uh, a lot of you know as the uh, X Kenwood rep in the UK. Um, also, I believe worked for ICOM at one point in time. Uh, he's no longer in the amateur radio market from a sales point of view, but a long-term radio operator, DX contester. But he's actually doing a solo cycle ride between Land's End and John O'Groats. Something like 900 miles, Chris. So uh, what do you think? Well, I think it's great, and I think we should all support him. So, yeah, he's doing, let's say, other than John O'Groats, for those of you not in the UK, that's the the very most northern north bit of the UK to the very most southern south bit of the UK. So it's pretty much as far as you can possibly cycle. It's around, as Mike was saying, it's around about 900, 900 miles. He's doing it uh, for charity. So he's doing it for a charity called Mine, which is a mental health charity. He's trying to raise 5,000 pounds. If you do a search on Just Giving, you'll find Mark's page. And, uh, and, and please donate. I think I will be doing that after the show. So um, yeah, he's, he's going to be taking... I think doing it ten is easy. It's time, it's time to do it over ten overnight stays. So what's that? Ten, eleven days, nine hundred miles. That's a pretty serious amount of cycling. You have to get pretty fit to do that. So uh, and he's also going to be operating throughout. So he's going to have a an aerial on the bike and some radio kit on the bike. I'm talking about having a special event uh, call sign. So uh, uh, not only can you donate and, and help out charity, you can also work him as well. So uh, it should be. Um, it should be good. Wish him all the best. I'm not sure exactly when he's planning to do it. It's not obvious from the site there, but um, I guess it'll be fairly soon. So, yeah, it sounds like a great, a great uh, worthwhile activity. So, I wish you all the best. And, uh, yeah, I hope he'll raise lots of money for, uh, for mine. And the good thing is uh, Mark's uh, wife, Georgina, is uh, very supportive and is going to go along and I think be his support crew as well. So, uh, it seems to be a family affair and... Uh, Martin, I know Mark's also got a youngster. Uh, Mark and Georgina have also got a youngster. So uh, sleepless nights for them, probably. What do you think, mine? Yeah, I mean, my initial thoughts, you know, seriously, mate, take the car. It's much quicker. But in all seriousness, go, Mark. Best of luck to you. I think you're crazy, um, but seriously, best of luck. And to uh, anybody that hears him um, calling out on the on the air, do give him a shout. I'm sure he'll appreciate the um, the motivation and the company uh, along his journey. And, uh, yeah, the Just Giving page is all uh, all online, justgiving.com slash fundraising slash M0DXR, if uh, people want to donate to his uh, his worthy cause. Yeah, yeah. And, Frank, I'm sure you met Mark with us when he was over uh, last year yes. in Dayton. Great guy. Yes, I did. Yeah. What do you I think, think of the ride? I think it's delightful. I think it's a, a way to combine one hobby with another. You have to be a bicyclist uh, hobbyist, so to speak, to do 900 miles. Uh, so I think this is a, this is a great thing, and uh, I, I think we all try to support it. I certainly do. And it's great to have your family, you know, supporting you because stuff can happen, pothole, you know, sprain your ankle, a lot of things. So I think it's all good. Yeah, yeah, I think it's good. It's a family thing. Ed, last words on this one. Uh, you haven't left me anything to say except uh, good on Mark, and uh, I hope it all goes without any unforeseen problems, and he raises a lot of money. Yeah, so Mark, if you're listening, and I'm sure you do, um, every, every success in this one, we wish you every success on this one. Have a good one. Okay, let's find out what the guys have been up to since the last time they recorded a podcast. So, Chris, what have you been up to? Well, not a lot apart from one particular day, which was last weekend, which was when you and I and Martin went out. I won't steal everyone's thunder, but uh, we went up to, uh, it was the SOTA uh, activity weekend, we, which we previously discussed on a, on a previous episode. So we went up to um, Ditchling Beacon and uh, operated a very, very windy radio station. And uh, I was working at Jeff, and I'll let you guys talk about what you were doing there as well. But uh, it was incredibly windy. We did manage to make some contact, but it was uh, really hard work. And then after that, we uh, got in the car and we went to visit another one of our presenters. But I'll let you guys talk about that when, you, when we come around to you. 
Yeah, Chris, that was a good Saturday out we had, the three of us. Mine, uh, do you want to comment what other things or what that work day or other things you've done? Um, other things, probably not very much. Um, I've been working at home, obviously tuning around the bands. You know, we've had a bit of bad weather recently. I say bad weather, we had some great weather. But when you have particularly hot weather, it follows with a thunderstorm. So needless to say, my antennas had been unplugged during that time. It's only, only recently I've got around to plugging them back in again. But I've been tuning around on HF, actually, and just listening to some of the medium wave stations. It's surprising how far, far medium wave stations are going, certainly now that some of the, 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 the broadcast stations are leaving medium wave. It seems to be leaving the, uh, the airwaves a bit clearer, and I'm picking up all sorts of uh, distant medium wave stations that uh, I wouldn't normally be able to hear. Radio Caroline is one of them. Also, BBC Radio Wales. I'm miles from Wales. I've never been able to hear that before, but hearing that, no problem at all. Yeah, Chris mentioned we've uh, we went out on Saturday, just not this Saturday that has just gone the Saturday before because obviously this goes out on Sunday. A week ago, did uh, so we did the uh, the social activation for Ditchling Beacon. Um, I didn't activate the um, U, uh, HF. I was playing with two meters, which was surprising fun. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all the rules that go with SOTA, and I don't have a SOTA account or anything like that, so I haven't put anything online to officially activate it. But I did get on the air, and I got um, five or six contacts on two meters, which was nice. But also, our trip out combined a pass of AO92 satellites. Um, in fact, I noticed on the AMSAT app that I was using, it said it was an AO91 passing, so I had my arrow antenna out and... Uh, had myself tuned to AO91 on the handheld, hearing absolutely nothing. Knocked the switch purely by accident, the AO92 settings, and heard uh, heard the satellite coming in. Uh, it was definitely AO92. I got six contacts, five of them in the UK and one in Spain, which was really, really good. And uh, one of those contacts was our mate Peter um, from the uh, CamHams 2E0SQL, who I know does a lot with satellites, and uh, I did tweet him afterwards and say, hey, can you help me out with details of a decent app to use for tracking them? And uh, he was kind enough to uh, reply to me and say, yeah, these are the two apps that I use. So, Peter, if you are listening to this, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And also uh, anyone that I did work that uh, was patient with me because, to say, first attempt at satellites. And, uh, yeah, that was, um, that was a real, real buzz for me. Yeah, it was a, it was a good day. Now... Ed couldn't hear me. He could hear Chris, but he couldn't hear me. So over to you, Ed. What have you been up to? Yeah, hi, guys. Yeah, um, I was just thinking it doesn't seem like uh, four weeks since the uh, the last ICQ podcast recording, and, of course, it wasn't. It was only two weeks because uh, Frank and myself and, and Bill were all on to record the feature for the last show, which was about the um, Portable Operations Challenge. And uh, we've all been working pretty hard on that over the last two weeks still. All ready to go, but uh, a lot of work put in anyway. And, yeah, um, as you said, I actually managed to work Chris. And Martin was, I don't know, I've sent, I've sent Chris a, a recording. Um, the audio seemed to be breaking up or something. So I'm not really sure why that was. With one person, it was okay. The same rig with another person, it wasn't. The Mysteries of Amateur Radio. No sort of activations to speak of because changing weather here, every time I try and plan one, I get up and then find it's either like today, it was like 80, 80 to 85 kilometer, uh, mile, try again, 80 to 85 kilometers per hour winds. And you don't want to be on top of a summit when that's happening. Other stuff I'm doing, I'm upgrading the home 40 meter loop antenna. Now I'm installing some new, uh, uh, fiberglass mast replace the ones that have aged somewhat. Some of them are maybe 10 years old now. And uh, at the same time, I'm taking the height up to uh, about 10 metres high, which is uh, convenient in Germany because you can go to that height without actually having to ask for planning permission. I've got a new toy came yesterday that I'll be playing with soon called uh, an ATU 100 EXT. It's a 65 euro fully built automatic ATU for portable use and perhaps I could do a review on it in the future if uh, if it seems interesting it does top band through six meters and up to 150 watts so uh, that's uh, ideal for uh, even a little bit of semi QRO when I'm out portable 
Uh, so all in all, bits and pieces of different things. And but the main thing that's been taking my time has been the uh, the FMH uh, portable operations uh, challenge. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, thanks, Ed. That sounds interesting. Frank, I know you've uh, been a very busy boy because you've got the portable operations challenge going, but you've also uh, been busy on other things, haven't you? I have been. Uh, and Ed uh, doesn't like a lot of compliments, but let me just underscore, Ed's been working very, very hard and, and uh, making a lot of contributions, as has everyone uh, for the most part on on the uh, – Portable Ops Challenge Steering Committee, very good group. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, Ed has come up with, and Ed, I'll steal your thunder for just a second, is whether or not uh, Amateur Radio Newsline and the ICQ podcast teams, do we want to have a little contest within the contest, depending on schedules and things like that. So we might have just a little award for within the Portable Ops Challenge, who among us, uh, you know, d- does the best. We are keeping score and that sort of thing. But that's something we can talk about more. But we certainly want to throw that out for on behalf of the um, Portable Ops Challenge that any other group that wants to do a game within a game, a uh, lot of enthusiasm for it. We, there are some other contests on the weekend of October 3rd and 4th. But, you know, as I've said uh, on another network, you'd have to use the Mayan calendar to find. Uh, as many weekends as there are amateur radio contests. So you'd only have one contest per weekend. So we're doing the best we can do a little bit of experimental year. We'll find out how it works, but I think the evidence is there, at least on paper from the Stu Perry 160 meter contest. If you divide the distance in kilometers by the power you use, the QRP folks can stand right in there with the QRO folks, but we'll keep scoring. We'll see. Also working on the next uh, year for our Homebrew Heroes Award program. And our uh, anonymous selection committee has given a name to Colin and Martin and me. We're happy with that name. We're putting some things together. Uh, we'll have an announcement uh, in October. And uh, we're, we're kind of excited with that. Um, on the ham radio per se point, I've added another little piece of test equipment, a little ESR, equivalent series resistor. Uh, meter. Uh, you can measure capacitors while they're in circuit uh, and, and some things like that, beginning to play with that. Also added uh, a Zygu G90, but been so busy on other things that's still in the box. I hope you get to pull that ad out. And finally, working with my uh, portable ops team, for whom this is named for, uh, get our rigs ready and being able to operate digitally and using the software we're going to use, picking a site out all the normal things that uh, that we do. But trying to stay out of trouble, Martin. Yeah, sounds busy to me, Frank. Sounds like you've been very busy to me. What have you been up to, Bill? So what I've been up to is, is very brief. I've only done FT8 for the last month. I've been chasing FT8 Club Awards because I realized I was relatively close on a whole bunch of awards. So I'm like, eh, I'll just sit down and, and hammer these out. And uh been having really good luck, believe it or not, on 17-meter FT8 because the bands are starting to cooperate a little bit. I also finally uh, got around to that, putting together the ham clock thing, which I posted a picture on Facebook uh, in the ICQ podcast group, I think last weekend. Uh, I finally got around to doing that as well. But that's about it. Well, sounds like you've been busy, Bill, but uh, as I say, You've done a fair bit, so I don't see what's wrong with that. Okay, what have I been up to? Well, apart from antagonising Mrs. B, who's had a bad back uh, most of the last couple of weeks, uh, but it's getting better. Life's been pretty good. I took two weeks' holiday from work. Um, It was two weeks' hard labour, really, because I had to uh, did some demolition work of a shed laying paving slabs and uh, erecting a new shed and putting all this stuff back in it. So for somebody who doesn't do manual labor, oh, it was hard work. But, hey, in between that, we had a little bit of fun. Um, yeah, Chris, uh, Martin, and I did go out to, on the SOTA event. We went to Ditchling Beacon, like they said. I had a couple of contacts on HF. 
uh, well, a couple of confirmed contacts on HF, a couple of confirmed contacts on VHF. So I, I was okay with that one. It was very windy up there, and we decided afterwards to go and see Edmund, who was doing uh, the International Lighthouse, because we were in about about five miles of where he was. So we tipped up into the car park, looked for him, couldn't find him, give him a call on two metres, and he came back, and Martin got the, got was first in the log uh, call, which was good. And uh, then we went over, uh, found Edmund in the car park, and the smile on Edmund's face, it was like from ear to ear. He was really pleased that we tipped up to see him. And he's a great guy, and we, we, we had fun. reason you guys in the States probably wouldn't have worked, Edmund, I know he worked 55, uh, 55 con- um, contacts, and uh, I think his furthest was Germany, actually, Ed. His antenna was fairly low to the ground. Uh, so I think he would have been predominantly doing um, predominantly doing uh, MVIS because uh, his fiberglass pole snapped when he was putting it up, so we had to put it a bit lower than normal. So that was that was good, and um, yeah, Martin worked the satellites, which was great fun. I've been on the local repeaters, talking to a lot of the local hams, yeah, and just finding out how everybody is, and. Uh, Last thing is, while I was on holiday, I confessed to buying a toy, which I didn't really need, but hey, it was something I thought, this is this I remember my holiday bought from. I bought a audio, um, audio meter, one of these ones with a microphone, it tells you how many dBs the noise is. Uh, so Lidl, one of the local German supermarkets we have in the UK, had one in at a stupid price, and it was enough to say, ah, oh, let's have a play. Let's have something to play with. So I've got a new toy, guys. But apart from that, I'll, be, I'll say very, very busy. We're hoping to get uh, Fusion back on GB3XP probably in the next couple of weeks. So uh, if that all goes well, it will be back on in the next couple of weeks. So that's what I've been up to. Martin, Martin, let, let me make one little plug um, for our feature for this this one. We talked about the uh, solar rays and some things like that and what the projections are. The feature this time is an interview that I did with Dr. Scott McIntosh, who has a team of researchers in Boulder, Colorado, and really the oldest astrophysics data collection lab, I think, uh, around back in the 1940s. I think our listeners would want to pay attention to this. He has a, a new model, what I call a better mouse trap. And for our Scottish listeners, I simply want to point out, we haven't forgotten about you. We are bringing you the mother tongue this time in the feature interview. Well, there you go, Frank. And uh, it's a good plug for the feature because uh, um, it's a good feature. Listen to it. There are a lot of people out there. That, that are hoping this is going to be a good uh, sunspot, you know, a good cycle. So, and uh, hopefully it will be one of the top five. So uh, uh, if uh, your interview is your interviewee is correct, Frank. So all in all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Another great show. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Mr. Martin Rothwell, who's probably going to try and get a few hours before his daughter gets her up, him up again. I reckon we've got about an hour if I'm lucky, but uh, yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, Martin's cool sign M0SGL, by the way. Mr. Ed Durant, DD5LP. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's okay if I wait four weeks before I come back again next time, isn't it? Oh, I don't know, Ed. I can make it four, eight, two, whatever. We might even <laughs> go weekly. No. <laughs> No. No, we're not going no. weekly. I cannot do weekly. <laughs> and uh, we'll move across the pond to Mr. Frank Hell, K4FMH. Thanks, Frank. Always a pleasure. Always a very much enjoyable for me. Thank That's you. That's great. That's great. Unfortunately, Bill's just had to leave us. He was on a hard stop. But Mr. Bill Barnes, WC3B, has uh, just left us. Thanks, Bill. We'll catch you in a couple of weeks.
73 all as I carry on with the rest of the podcast. Cheers, 73. guys. 73. Nah, I don't like either. But I do like operating my ham radio rig outdoors. But on contest days, well, the superstations always seem to win. So here's the deal. The steering committee has taken a bulldozer to level the playing field between the big guns and the little pistols in the Fox Mike Hotel Portable Ops Challenge. It's October 3rd and 4th, 2020. See foxmikehotel.com and click the POC tab. Will you take the challenge? Now it's time to have a look at the news in brief with me, Colin M6BLY. We start with news here and congratulations to David Minster. November Alpha 2, Alpha Alpha. And uh, David resides in New Jersey. He's uh, about to become the new chief executive of the ARRL. And he'll start his role in the end of September. Uh, David says that uh, he's uh, looking to build a culture of accomplishment and accountability, and that's uh, where his uh, strengths lie. His initial focus will be working with the board on establishing strategic goals and concrete plans to navigate the AWL through the digital transformation required for the coming decades of its second century. Uh, so uh, David uh, became a uh, novice licensee back in 1977 when he held the call sign Whiskey Bravo 2, Mike Alpha Echo. Uh, and then was back in his teens, he progressed um, from advanced to amateur extra. And after a stint as November Whiskey 2 Delta, he settled on the vanity call sign of NA2 Alpha Alpha in the 90s as a way to honor his mentor who held the call sign N2 Alpha Alpha uh, and the contestation that he frequently used as well in New York. So uh, along with his interest, obviously be an AWL member and amateur radio uh, enthusiast, he's also a member of AMSAT and has a special interest in satellites, digital communications, remote operation and ham radio computing and software. So David, we wish you all the best in your new role. And unfortunate news now um, of the Finlay uh, Radio Club uh, in Ohio, uh, they've had to announce the uh, cancellation of their ham fest that was due to take place in September. And this could potentially disappoint up to 2,000 attendees that cover coming from the Ohio, Michigan and Indiana region. Uh, so it looks like another uh, I say, ham fest has fallen silent this year. I've got a feeling this is going to be a continual news story for the rest of the year. I can't see any more of these ham fests taking place this year, at least, as government restrictions seem to uh, rule out any opportunity uh, to meet from there. But certainly one of the things that is on the growth is obviously club nets and ways of communicating and virtual uh, ham groups, etc. So certainly look out for things that can replace events like this. And we finish up our news in brief uh, roundup uh, with a proposal from the FCC. And the FCC are proposing to reinstate amateur radio service fees. Uh, this fee will be $50 uh, for each amateur radio license application, uh, but it would exclude administration requests, things like address changes, uh, etc. Now, this is all coming about from a, uh, a law. They're called the Repack Airways Yielding Better Access for Modern uh, Services Acts um, back in 2018, also called the Ray Worms uh, Act. And basically it requires that services like the FCC actually charge uh, the cost of administrating their services rather than like a nominal fee, uh, like a cost of board they've been doing already. So the $50 fee uh, will cover all sorts of things, obviously, like um, new license holders, etc. Also, applications for uh, vanity call signs as well, fee from there. Now, there is an opportunity to uh, put forward thoughts on this, etc. Uh, it is at the moment a proposal that they're uh, they're proposing from there. So, as I say, you need to uh, lodge any thoughts with the FCC directly. As always, we'll put all the information on this uh, announcement on icqpodcast.com. So, check that out if this is something of uh, potential interest to yourself. Right, now we head over to our features episode, and certainly looking forward to this one. Uh, this is our Frank Aguila for Foxtrot Mike Cotel's discussion with Dr. Scott McIntosh. Uh, and Scott is the, he works at the National Center of Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and he's going to be talking about the bumper new solar cycle on the way. So guys, I really hope you enjoy this feature. And now what you've all been waiting for. This episode's feature from the ICQ podcast.
Hello, everybody. This is Frank K4FMH, Fox Michael Tell, with another feature interview for the ICQ podcast. If my guest today was a member of the Fab Four, the Beatles, he would have clearly written this song. One day you'll look to see how I've gone, or tomorrow may rain, so I'll follow. But since we can't all be members of the Beatles, he may just settle for operating an Apple computer. And there's a tie-in there as well. My guest today is Dr. Scott McIntosh. He is a solar scientist, and he's going to tell us about the research that he and his team has been involved with and explain some things to us amateur radio operators and shortwave listeners about sunspot cycles, how they work, why there's disagreements about these things, and it's just it's fair science. Welcome, Scott. Glad to have you with me today. Hi, Frank. It's a pleasure to be with you and to talk to your uh, friends and colleagues. That is terrific. Before our recording, I mentioned to Dr. McIntosh that he has a radio surname. The name of McIntosh in radio manufacturing is legendary. He was not familiar with that, so I'm sure he's going to run out and find him an antique McIntosh stereo receiver here just as soon as we finish. Scott, you know, you've been getting a lot of press lately. You and your team have published some interesting uh, scientific results that have been peer-reviewed. They're not just papers that have been put out there in pre-print, but they've kind of passed muster with peers. And as someone who's published peer-reviewed papers and books and stuff myself, you can get beat up pretty tough in that peer review, but that's what helped make science good. We'll talk a good bit about that, that you and your team feel like you've got a little better mousetrap, so to speak, on how to figure out when sunspot cycles end and begin, and also the forecast for sunspot cycle 25. But let's do what I Einstein told us to do is explain things simply because you understand them. What the heck is a sunspot cycle? All right, a sunspot cycle, that's a complex thing. So I'm going to clear up some terminology. So there's two things. There's a sunspot cycle and the solar cycle, and they're used interchangeably. Okay, so the sunspot cycle, the solar cycle is the very generic term used for how this, you know, the energy from the star, um, our star, varies over a function of time, okay? Uh, and it ebbs and wanes. It peaks and troughs on the time scale of about 11 years. We talk about in the 11-ish year solar cycle, where the peaks can be uh, uh, separated by as little as eight years or as far separated by 14 years, and same with the troughs. And so it's not really peri- uh, not really a periodic thing, but it's called a cycle because it because it wobbles like waves in the ocean, right? And then you have the sunspot cycle. So the solar cycle can apply to everything from F10.7 radio flux that you're probably familiar with. It waxes and wanes on that time scale. It can go to um, how much ultraviolet light there is from the star. It can go to also how much magnetism that the sun produces, etc. All of those things are thrown into the big bucket of solar cycle. Okay. The sunspot cycle is a manifestation, okay? It is, you know, the sun is pockmarked like a teenager with these dark features. And those dark features were first kind of catalogued by Galileo, right? The, uh, and, and others long before that with the naked eye. But Galileo, at the dawn of uh, the development of the telescope, took a real fascination with sunspots. So they appeared as dark features on this beautifully opaque disk. And Galileo took daily drawings of those. In fact, there's beautiful animations available on the web where you can go and see um, how Galileo's drawings were stitched together about, what, about 150 years later maybe even as much as 200 years later, someone actually figured out that that the number of these dark features went up and down on this timescale, okay? And so that this is really where where the term solar cycle really originated was from the modulation of sunspots up and down over that time frame. So I kind of got the narrative a little bit backwards, but you know, you kind of kind of understand the entomology in, in a perverse way. That you know, the thing that we we talk and we interchangeably use solar cycle and sunspot cycle. Solar cycle is everything. Sunspot cycle is specific to those, and so that was discovered in about the, the mid 1850s. That that the sunspot number actually went, the number of sunspots that the sun could produce 
went up and down as a function of time. It took another 50 years. I'm probably getting all these dates wrong, but it took another period of time to notice that those spots themselves don't just appear at random on the sun's face, okay? They systematically plotted them as a function of latitude and noticed that they start at about mid-solar latitude, so about 30 degrees or so, and over the function of that 11-ish years, they migrate towards the sun's equator before, poof, they disappear. Scott, let me interject this. Uh, Hams know a lot about latitude and longitude on the Earth, and we use the Maidenhead grid squares frequently to identify Mm -hmm. where we're located roughly. And so I want to make this point that solar scientists do something similar for the sun. So that's what you were getting at about where on that sun's disk these things seem to emanate. Right. And so, you know, magically, you know, after that progression towards the equator, as if almost by magic, right? So that's a, that's a, the link into where we're going to go later, right? Almost by magic, you know, within, you know, two years later, there's like a sawtooth function, you know, they jump back up and they start to appear again at 30 degrees latitude. Now, if we jump forward another couple of decades, a really bright guy called George Hill, who had built the Wilson tel- uh, the Wilson Tower, the big tower telescope down in uh, outside LA. Man, Mount Wilson. Man, I'm losing it today. Right. Not no, no, I, you're right. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Right? Just a genius. He's the godfather of solar physics. He's the... He's the guy that created the astrophysical journal. I mean, you name it, he was at the root of it. What he'll notice, because he built a device to measure the Zeeman effect. And so for for those of you that haven't done quantum mechanics, the Zeeman effect. So what happens when you take a, a cloud of ionized gas and pass it through a magnetic field is that the spectral lines, so the spectral lines that the gas emits actually separate. It depends on the internal structure of the atom that you're trying to measure. So like, for example, helium will, certain lines in helium will change more than lines in iron for example. And what Hale identified was that he could measure the separation. So he had such a good telescope and such great equipment back at the turn of the century that he could actually measure in very fine detail the separation of these spectral lines and and using basically a ruler, right? Basically a ruler was able to determine that these spots on the sun were magnetic in origin, right? Up to that point, they didn't know what the hell they were. But not only that, that over the course of this seesaw, this zigzag pattern of where the spots were and how they appeared, that somehow the sun magically flipped magnetic polarity on its on the same time scale. So this the cycle, the sunspot cycle, the solar cycle was 11-ish years, but what Hale noticed was that that was only half of the magnetic cycle, right? So that, you know, if you think of it then, then that what that means basically is the magnetic cycle of the sun is every 22 years, okay? Put that in a little bit of context for the Earth. The magnetic poles on this Earth do flip too, Mm -hmm. but on the timescales of hundreds of thousands of years. So for an object the size of the sun to pull this stunt off in the early 1900s was a bit staggering to people, right? Because, you know, you can go back in the literature and find some just pure crazy talk about what sunspots were. But, you know, they knew that they were vortices, or they talked about them as light in the context of hurricanes and tornadoes. But Hale was the guy that identified that, yeah, they were large magnetic concentrations. And so that really started solar physics. So I kind of really digress there, but that takes us to, to the kind of next step. So you've got solar cycles, you get sunspot cycles. But on top of that, or actually beneath each of them, is this thing that we, we call the Hale cycle, right? So this magnetic activity cycle, which is, you know, for you guys, it's the fundamental. So right. to me, it's the fundamental, right? It is the it is the, the alpha, right? Yeah. It is the framework on which you have to build everything else. And so the big question in solar physics, and probably in large parts of astrophysics, is where the hell does that come from, right? What creates that rapid turnover in magnetic field, which then ultimately gives lead to sunspots, which gives lead to flares and coronal mass ejections and a lot of the manifestations of that we see on our planet see this is important for hams ham radio operators because what you're talking about are the fundamentals that drive the measured observable of sunspot cycles the sun 
the, yeah, the sunspots are the measures and the fundamentals of this, what's driving. And that's an important concept for amateur radio operators to learn. And let me point out, this is the evolution of most sciences. Lord Kelvin said, when you begin to measure, you have then stepped into the world of science. And only then when you begin to measure. So you've talked about the history of some of these ideas and then the measurements. The same thing happened with cancer. Cancer as a concept began as a blob. It's not this, that, or the other. So hmm, it's this thing we're going to call it cancer. Now we have all kinds of cancer because the science has evolved. Please continue, right. Scott. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's a... It has become a tremendous challenge. If I jump forward you know, another 50 or 60 years, you've now got a greater number of samples, right? Uh, somewhat improvement in technology, you know, to the point where in the early 50s, they developed this thing called a magnetograph, which was very much more, you know, Hale's method was very selective because they just didn't have the capabilities. But in the 50s, they developed this thing called a magnetogram, which basically swept across the disk of the sun in the sky and measured, basically routinely measured magnetic fields. And so at the start of that, you know, within about four or five years of that, ideas were being postulated about what was the mechanism that was driving the sun's magnetism. And, and to, to be very frank with you, Frank, you've probably never heard that before. No, I, first time. Uh, um, what the ideas about how the sun's internal magnetic machine works were kind of cemented in place in the late 50s and maybe the early 60s. And so the, I'll hesitantly use the word dogma, but the we, dogma... We all have it in science, and that's over dogma, a half century old. Yeah, the dogma was created then. The, the current practitioners of the same work haven't really advanced significantly from that stage. The problem is, and it's the same with climate, it's the same with weather, it's the same with any kind of physical complex, physical system. You can't predict it. Or there's great value in saying you can't predict it. Take your pick, right? And so, you know, there's, you know, you're aware of the book um, by Upton Sinclair, The Jungle. Yes. You know, that, that a man's ability to understand something is directly related to his ability to understand or, right. or words to that effect. Right. In other words, if that's going to move my cheese. I'm just going to ignore it. We have a similar thing in political science called a likely voter. And right now in this election season in the U.S. at least, we have these polls and they say likely voters say X or Y in certain percentages. I've done these polls myself. The thing you have to keep in mind, don't ever confuse a likely voter with one who casts a ballot. Right. Similar kind of thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, and if you go down that path, we'll be, we'll, yeah, you're in trouble. But I think that's a thing that even the, the lay people tend to do in, in our world. Uh, even the practitioners have done that. They've, so what they've done, if I really digest it down, uh, and you were, we're shortcutting a little, and I think we'll come back to this, but what's really happened is sunspots are the prominent feature of solar magnetic activity. I will not argue that. But they're not everything. But what's happened is that the, these classes of models have been developed where, you know, I, how do I put it? They've been developed only on sunspots, okay? Right. And they're still only developed on sunspots. However, there's ranges of other phenomena and manifestations. For example, one that we just published last year is a beautiful record taken uh, from five different observatories in in Helium, where the light of helium of the star, where you can see these prominences above the solar limb, and you you can look at any kind of solar image available on the internet right now, and you can see these things called prominences, and they're they're called prominences because well they were prominent above the solar limb, right? Mm -hmm. We're we're not geniuses, right? We will kind of call it as it is, but if you catalog their behavior, you get sunspot cycle plus. Mm -hmm. It's like. And, and so as you bootstrap more information into the framework, you rapidly begin to figure out that the sunspots themselves are only telling you a fraction of the story. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go into a different part where my origins in, in physics are in, around inverse problems and understanding remote sensing, whether it's through someone's brain, whether it's your blood flow, whether it's whatever, you basically use this mathematical trick to back out what you measure from what the physics is or the chemistry or the biology right well part of the problem is there if you're trying to solve a problem and you really only have half the data available to you the the span of possible explanations is massive mm -hmm. right and right. so the idea usually the idea is that by adding more data 
not necessarily all data, but more data, you can bring that space down to where you're closer to the underlying physics, right? Right. And so the problem is that they've built all these models and constructs on a very limited data set. Right. And that limited data set, what happens there is it's all well and good when you're dealing with history and you think you understand all the physics and you can tune the model, okay? The problem is when you allow it to play in in the future mode where you're no longer driving it with observables and it goes you know for the lack of a better term ass over tip right okay i mean it doesn't work and then you find a lot of a multitude of ways of trying to explain why it doesn't work but you just keep going anyway right. you know because right. you get nothing else everything that looks like a nail i have a hammer and so I, absolutely and so this is where our team has come in i distinctly recall the evening that i had my epiphany we were studying a different class of event a different class of magnetic object something that's there throughout the entire solar cycle and sunspot cycle but shows similar evolutionary patterns so it starts at a given latitude on the sun and over some period of time they migrate towards the sun's equator and then magically at the equator we what we found was that they just disappear i mean literally over the time scale of about a solar rotation so one month they just disappear only to grow significantly in amplitude right so at mid solar latitude I mean, it's like, and in the sun's context, it is literally the blink of an eye. And so what that allowed us to do was to understand, and I'm I'm cutting off a huge part of the story, but what that basically the epiphany was, we were able to track the hail cycle, right? So, you know, I would talked earlier about how the hail cycle, the magnetic cycle underlies the solar cycle and the sunspot cycle. Mm -hmm. And so what we were able to do by tracking these other magnetic features, and we're not the first people to do that. It was actually... I found that it was also done in the 80s, but it got deep sixed somehow. That we were able to track the underlying hail cycle. And what we saw was the end point when, when these features just disappear at the sun's equator. So it's kind of like having a hurricane and it turtles along and then just poof, just magically disappears, right? Just like just evaporates with no cause. We see these features, they move towards the equator, they disappear. At the exact same time that they disappear, the new cycle sunspots appear at mid-latitudes. It's like in abundance. The growth becomes rampant, Uh right? You know, we all know that, you know, and my peers will tell you, oh, we know that sunspot cycles overlap, right? We know that you can still have, right right now is a perfect example. You still have cycle 24 spots near the equator while you're getting preliminary cycle 25 spots at mid latitudes the problem is they don't last more than a solar rotation they're transients right we call we i refer to them as transient spots they're not there but the interesting part is that those longitudes actually are kind of hot spots for recurring features so they may be there one rotation disappear on the subsequent one but then appear again on the one after that right so there's like longitudinal hot spots and so what we basically identified was that there was a trigger event in this whole mess where the last hail cycle dies at the sun's equator and it gives rise to the spots on the hail cycle that was following it now in doing even more detective work, more forensic, so I tell the story around that. We published a paper in 2014 talking about this overlapping, interfering system of magnetic bands that were basically the hail cycle, and that the sunspot cycle is only a byproduct of this underlying thing, right? Right. But the beauty of the analysis is that because you can track it observationally, you can also project it out and it's very linear, or at least it appears to be very linear. And it has been for the 10 years we've been tracking it and the 23 years that it's been in the data. And then if you do more detective work, the 140 years that it's been in the data. So we made some very bold statements in those papers about what cycle 25 was going to look like almost well before the two-year battle to get the thing published that's what our listeners need to understand is very often the science that hits the news stream was conducted several years before and so for scientists they're kind of in that next wave of their studies and their other follow-up research 
when the science that we see comes out. That's a key thing that our listeners need to understand simply about the publication cycle in science. And I can test from personal experience. You get reviewers who perhaps the editor chose uh, incorrectly, as uh, the Harrison Ford character said in one of the Indiana Jones about the the Holy Grail. You've chosen wisely or unwise. Sometimes, (laughs) and I've done this as an editor, you've chosen unwise. Sometimes you get an unfair, uh, someone who's not really trained in to know can judge. So it can take yeah. some time. We see a mix of poor editing and, and bad reviewers. And it's always reviewer two, instantly. There's an interesting <laughs> meme flying around. And it's always reviewer two. There is a sociology, if you will, about who the second reviewer is. You always want to get someone who purely knows the science. Some editors think you need to get somebody who's not in that specialty as reviewer number two. There used to be a a popular movie called Kill Cutie, and I think Mm -hmm. they need to do a new version for scientists called Kill Reviewer Number Two. Just kidding. I don't mean that for real. Scott, what we're got? No comment. No comment. Tell us where you're located briefly. I don't want to interrupt the story, but I think it's important for our listeners to know not only who you are personally, but where you're situated and just a brief comment about the institution that you're in. Yeah, sure. So I'm I'm located in Boulder, Colorado. I moved here from Glasgow in Scotland. Scotland, the sun's a theoretical object, (laughs) Uh, but... I uh, moved here at the turn of the century. Moved, I've been here kind of ever since. Worked for NASA and the European Space Agency in D.C. for a few years. I came back to work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. A component of that is the High Altitude Observatory, and that's the world's oldest and I would say foremost space weather and solar physics lab. It's been around since 1940. I was fortunate enough in 2014 to be appointed as director of that observatory, and I stood down from that job about a year ago formally um, to go work in the director of the center. So I'm presently the deputy director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So Dr. McIntosh really is at the forefront of where the science emanates around. There's a lot of data that there is produced that is publicly available and this sort of thing. We're going to get back to this story that Dr. McIntosh is weaving because if I understood what you're saying is what you have really begun to emphasize is the hail cycle as a driving yep. force. As a, and really hams may not have heard of that. They may not be aware of that. So what you've done is a little better mousetrap in the sense that you're observing a feature that is driving what we've been focusing on the surface. Why do waves happen? Sometimes beneath the surface of water, there is the bathymetry that you are underwater waves that moves right. and this sort of thing. Uh, Scott's going to continue that story, what their innovation is and why it differs perhaps from some of the other science that has been around for a long time. Perhaps you can refer to this dogma, perhaps it's the accepted gospel, if you will. I'm a Presbyterian, so my, my fellow <laughs> Scott here, we, we share kilt. We share kilt bagpipe, bagpipe sir. Uh, so continue on with this story. You, you got a new idea, a well-established alternate idea that it's the underdriving force for these time series on sunspots. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Frank. And so we got to the point where we could understand the trigger event for the last for solar cycle twenty four and twenty three. David, usually in science, that's not enough. Two examples is one is a fluke. Two is mm, five is. Mm, you may be onto something. Twelve is well, kind of could be on, could be right. 24, Ooh, you're, you're pushing it here now, pal. And so the large part of our work in the last couple of years has been trying to trace that back in time. So now that we know what the diagnostics were, and we really didn't want to get into the mess around the modeling, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> really, no. Be objective, stick to the observations, and that's all well and good until the observations start to fly in the face of the model, right? Mm-hmm. So basically, you go out and you talk to your peers and say, you can't run. That model doesn't have enough information to constrain the physics of the problem. Because what we rapidly found out was that, and we're still not entirely sure why, the sun has a magic latitude, right? At 55 degrees latitude seems to be the place, it's kind of like you know Livingston and Stanley, right? Mm-hmm. The, the root of the Nile, the source of the Nile seems to be at 55 degrees latitude for some reason. And as we've done our forensics going back in time, so if I turn the dial back a little bit and remember I talked about mid-latitudes, 30 degrees. So all of the modeling activities 
have been focused on making sunspots appear at 30 degrees latitude. But when we started working on the hail cycle, what we identified, we could trace the tributaries back to 55 degrees latitude. But not only that, 10 years before those bands ever gave rise to sunspots, right? So you could see the trail of breadcrumbs not only going back in time, but to higher latitudes. And the problem with a lot of the models is they don't reproduce that behavior, uh-huh. right? They're not geared up to reproduce that behavior, but they don't even reproduce it by accident. So right? if there are enough anomalies in the traditional model that you're bringing to the forefront and pointing out. Yeah, that's it. We're basically kind of forensically going back and looking at terabytes and tens of terabytes of data going back decades and, and now over a century where we can identically trace these hail cycle patterns back in time to, to the point where we can start to actually develop insight into how to play them forward, right? Because they don't change. Right. That, that's that's the wacky thing is there's a paper that we're working on um, that shows that the hail cycle doesn't vary. Ah. The only thing that varies is how the hail cycles interfere with one another, mm. right? It's how they interact. And it's the interaction that's changing the sunspot number. Right. Ah, yeah. And that's you. So we got the hint of that in twenty, you know, twenty eleven when we we started the battle on the first paper, which eventually was published at the the very start of twenty fourteen. But we we were so convinced that that worked, we started tracing the data back to the point where we can observationally see it back to the eighteen sixties. Um, so we we were all went all the way back to the dawn of photographic plates of the sun. Wow. Right. Uh, and the data is beautiful and shocked. We were shocked, absolutely shocked to find that at the turn of the century, after only three or four decades worth of observation, people were publishing the same patterns that we are going back and finding, right? But they got ignored. They started to, and well, I don't know if anyone just, I think people just didn't put it together. I you see. know, I, I don't think so much that they were ignored. You know, it was the dawn of a new era in the field, and it was like a sparkling thing, right? We didn't really have astrophysics at that time. You know, that was before, you know, just about the time of Einstein. And so solar physics was the thing, right? In in that whole area, that it was the Lamborghini. It was the Tesla. In, in, fact, to the Yugo, in right? fact, you could say that solar physics, or at least in terms of the astronomer who went out to get uh, the pictures of the eclipse, is what won Einstein his Nobel. Yep, Eddington. Yes. Yeah. Eddington's experiment basically confirmed general relativity. So to me, the sun has always been a Rosetta Stone for understanding other stars. And that, you know, I've taken that um, from from each of my mentors that I've had, that if you want to understand other stars, you should really start understanding our own because right. we can almost touch it and you know with the parker solar probe we can practically touch it so Scott, I, I don't know if you're aware of this but there's a group of yeah. amateur radio operators under a program called ham science or ham sci and one of the things that that group is doing is using a lot of amateur radio transmissions from point A to point B and their signal to noise ratio and some of those other kinds of things to try to look at the effects of solar weather on some of that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's under the rubric of citizen science. But yeah. some some of that group, which is uh, based out of University of Scranton and a young assistant professor there, Nathaniel Frizzell, mm-hmm. uh, who's got some NSF money and I think he just got a NASA grant. He's trying to put together all these sensors around the world and yep. sort of a, a, a citizen thing to look at the, that. So uh, I'll follow up with you and I'll make a connection between you and Dr. Frizzell because I think at least knowing about that would be a good thing. So for amateur radio operators who sort of worship at the holy grail of the smooth sunspot number and occasionally <laughs> uh, step over to the flux index uh-huh. uh, and uh, sometimes talk about flux capacitors as they did in Back <laughs> to the Future. Yeah, Professor uh, Brown, eh? What, what right great scott absolutely scott so what is the come up of uh, for hams in terms of your research who kind of want to go wait a minute now that's heresy but it's really <laughs> just just the the way science works and you've got a new idea on some observations that weren't seen in this new with right. conceptual way Right. And it may be, you never know, but it may be a revolutionary turning point in changing how we look at the realization of the hail cycle 
in terms of how it's manifested to observe sunspots. Is that a fair layperson's rendition? I, absolutely. You know, and we're not deliberately not trying to slam our peers. They've been working on a limited set of information. The problem is, to me, is like, how do you adapt your philosophy when presented with these new observations? Right. And, and the new observation should be seen to augment what you've got, not criticize. Right. And well, it's a little like using optical telescopes here on terrestri- on, on the Earth. And the first time we actually got beyond our atmosphere with the Hubble. And looking in the ultraviolet or the infrared. Yeah. I mean, suddenly we, we got beyond the heat distortion of the atmosphere. And it's not the folks here on Earth using their optics that are they're bad people or bad scientists or wrong necessarily. It's just that we had a new way of seeing things. Correct, correct. Well, that, and that's that's kind, terrific. That, that's kind of where we're at. But you know, long story short, when we've we've now performed this analysis going back to you know we can use other tricks. So what we basically you know, in 2014 we identified these terminator events, things these the end points of hail cycle. Okay. Now, now this is a paper published in Solar Physics in 2020, uh, volume 295, timing terminators forecasting sunspot cycle 25 onset. Yeah. That's and that's one of the things that's caught some imag- some imagination of hams. Right. And so what we had to do based on our peer reviews. So in 2014, we we identified two of them. And in the same paper, I guess, we, we identified six of these events going back to your, your favorite cycle 19. Right. Right. Yeah. And we kind of left it. We kind of left it and went back because we were working on, on other stuff um, related to hail cycles and complexity and 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 how you can make freakish active regions that spew out fire across the solar system. But other than that, we then came back to it because we're like, wait a minute, what is the physics going on in the star where a transition like that can happen in the space of one rotation? That's just mind boggling, right? The sun basically undergoes a metamorphosis on the time scale of one solar rotation. It switches off at the equator and boom, and, and subsequently, what we found was it doesn't just do that. It also triggers something at 55 degrees, this magic latitude again, right? So you get three things happening at almost the same time. Equator, mid-latitude, where we see the sunspots grow, and then high latitude, where we start to see actually see the sun's magnetic field reverse. That is, I mean, it's triggered. So in writing that work and writing it up and exploring that work, we were quizzed by our colleagues that they didn't quite believe this. And we had to go through ridiculous hoops to show not two, not six, but 14 separate instances of this behavior. Okay. And that wasn't enough. Okay. That wasn't enough. 14 wasn't enough. And so they said it was too um, subjective. And so we had to develop a mathematical approach. So an algorithmic approach to looking at other data to see if we could verify and so we did that and we used a mathematical trick um, called a Hilbert transform mm-hmm. so every a lot of your folks are probably familiar with uh, Fourier transforms right? right absolutely but maybe not so familiar with Hilbert transforms mm-hmm. Hilbert transforms are distinguished from the fact that the phase in the signal isn't fixed, right? So a Fourier transform has fixed phase, which allows you to then build a sum of cosines and sines that m- replicate the signal, right? That's that's mm-hmm. the basic assumption. A Hilbert transform gives you a wee bit more flexibility in phase space. And so what we found was, uh, and so what it basically does is it takes your time series of whatever you want, whether it's sunspots or whatever, let's just talk about sunspot. What it basically identifies, the outputs of that are two things. There's a function of the amplitude as a function of time, and then there's the phase function as, as a function of time, okay? And so if you take 350 years of sunspots and you pass it through a Hilbert transform, you get amplitude and phase. And what we noticed was there was recurrent patterns in the amplitude and phase diagrams when the Terminator happened. So, I mean, it's a unique signature. And what it's basically identifying is the maximum rate of change of, of whatever you're measuring, right? It's actually used for things like EKGs and, you know, it's built into devices that monitor heartbeats. Right. Right. And so 
what it basically triggered on was these rapid escalations in activity. And and so we applied it uh, in this paper that you're talking about, the one uh, that's Ta- you know, timing terminators. Right, right now, allowed us to go back and extend that record to 24. So to all measurable sunspot cycles, all the ones that have been catalogued since 1757. Mm. So right back to sunspot cycle zero, okay? <laughs> including your favorite. And including the Dalton minimum and including the what other minima they've been in that time frame, right? So not just sunspot minima, but grand-ish minima. So we have a sample of those. And what we noticed was that the separation of the terminators with time is linearly related to the strength of the sunspot cycle, right? So remember how I talked a little bit earlier about how the hail cycles overlap? Right. And so what you basically, and you have a situation when one hail cycle terminates at the equator, you have the next sunspot cycle already visible at mid-latitude, okay? And so when the terminator happens, the new one springs to life. And so what we noticed was there was a linear relationship between the separation of the terminator events and the strength of that cycle that's going to be. Editorial note. This is the key finding for amateur radio operators to understand what Dr. McIntosh and his team's research means for his prediction for Solar Cycle 25. Now let's continue. I mean, it's a beautiful, we couldn't, well, we kind of imagined it in early days, but we didn't have the data to say that it really existed. That was a hunch, right? Uh, Right. That somehow the overlap and the interference acted to constrain how many spots you could make. But now the data is telling you your hunch was probably right. And so what we've been waiting on is the next Terminator. So we're currently in solar minimum. And if you find a schematic, and it might be useful for your listeners to find a schematic of this, or I can supply you with one if you want. But if you look at where the hail bands are, sunspot minimum is identically the time when you have four oppositely polarized magnetic bands within 40 degrees of the sun's equator. Ah. So it's like a time of mutual cancellation. The things just cancel, okay? And this is how the Terminator works. The Terminator dies at the, so the two bands nearest to the equator die. And when they die, that's when you get growth on the two remaining ones. Very often we have audio problems where microphones give feedback and squeal. Yeah. And that's what cancels them out. So for our listeners, there's not exactly the same, but it's a kind of a similar concept that Scott's talking about here. Yeah. And so so what we've basically got now, we have four bands within 35 degrees of the equator right now, right? So the sun's basically not making spots, but you get these little sporadic things because what it's about imbalance in the sun's internal pressure. You can think of these things as bubbles, right? right? And you can think of the sun as being a buoyant ocean. And the magnetic field beneath is like a submarine. It's really trying to be buoyant and pop to the surface. But the way the magnetic field is oriented, it keeps it trapped. So when you free up pressure by the Terminator event happening, you get you all of a sudden get a lot of bubbles, right? Ah, right. Sunspot, right? And so what we're waiting on right now is that we're in the very death rows of sunspot cycle 24. The final embers of the cycle are at the equator. And so what we're waiting on is that next Terminator for the trigger for cycle 25. Now, I know when the last one happened. It happened on the 11th of February, 2011. Not the month of February. Well, kind of. I I guess I could give you an error bar that says it happened in February of 2011. If it happens, and so what I said earlier was when the Terminators get separated out wider, the amplitude, the strength of the upcoming cycle is very weak. So that's a characteristic we see of very weak cycles, is that the Terminators are very separated. In fact, uh, cycle 24 is an example of that. So that can be like 13, 14, 15 years. But the cycles, like your favorite one, number 19, the cycle, the Terminator separation there is only eight years. So short separation in the Terminators mean big cycle upcoming because the underlying hail cycle doesn't change, right? Right. So do the math, okay? What our relationship shows that if the Terminator for cycle 24 happens sometime in the next year, which we fully anticipate it to do, it means that the separation is no, is less than 10 years, which means that we get a good read from 24 examples of what the sun is going to tell us the amplitude of cycle 25 is going to be, right? So we have 24 points on a line. And basically, you know, in a nutshell, it tells us that Sunspot Cycle 25 could be one of the top five all time. Now, now folks, this is the better mousetrap that Scott's telling us about. They've taken 
a little different perspective scientifically, looked at some stuff that hadn't been looked at. Let's say your car is making that chicka, chicka, chicka sound, and the typical mechanic would say it's your brakes, and they've always fixed your brakes, and you spent several hundred dollars, but the chicka, chicka still came back. It's time to look somewhere else, folks. And this is kind of what Scott's saying. They're looking at a little different part with the relationship of the hail cycle and the location on the sun and its configuration to this kind of area that he's been describing, if I'm not screwing that up totally, Scott. Yeah, and so good. that's the better mousetrap. What he's seeing is the predictor is very stable. These new relationships they've observed, because nobody's ever really done it this way before, is showing that we're about to have a very strong one. And this favorite cycle, 19, that he's talking about, it's the one that most of the graybeard hams grew up on as teenagers when you could work the world on 10 meters. So when everybody talks about that as a heyday and everything's gone to hell in a handbasket since then. And this is why what he is saying is so important. And yet the old time hams, and I'm 67, so I'm, I, I are one, Scott, I tend to not want to believe it. But this is the yep. better mousetrap that science, in its own merry way, goes through. And he's had the normal struggles, I would say, maybe a little above average. If we could get rid of reviewer number two, it would make life a little easier. But getting these things to peer review and to prove it to one another before it's shown to us. That's exciting. Yep. Yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, you can make a definitive prediction. I mean, one of the caveats I'll say, though, Frank, is, hold on, my, my three-year-old just joined me. <laughs> I'm trying to try to get my brain back. Yeah, you had what just the, finished why this is going to be one of the strongest on record. Yeah, and so what I was going to say, there's a very important caveat. The, the relationship under predicts big cycles because it's, it's an average. Mm -hmm. And so the big cycles tend to live above, the, way above the average, actually. And, and so what the, we're, we're worried about is we're actually under predicting the strength of this cycle. The kind of crazy part is it's that what we're basically predicting is double the magnitude of the consensus opinion of the quote-unquote experts in the field the who, have largely, who have been largely using the limited sunspots only data set. Yeah. And so you couldn't have a clearer schism, right? right. Sometimes it can be a nuance. It's, oh, it's a few percent off and so we can get away with it. But you couldn't have a clearer schism. And so if we are right, within about six to eight months following the Terminator, which we will make a large song and dance about, because we predicted it in 2014, we will be able to definitively tell you a lower bound on what Cycle 25 is going to look like. Listen, I want to go ahead and pre-book your act. I would love to get video of the song and dance. I think a few bagpipes from the Scottish Highlands ought to be kind of in the background. Because if, in fact, when that happens, that will be, from my point of view on this, Scott, a true advance, if not a leap forward in our understanding of sunspots. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, but you know, it's it's funnily enough, it's broader than that because, it, like I said earlier, if our star is doing it, and according to astrophysicists, our star is boring. If our mediocre star is doing it, the other stars are doing it too. And in fact, when you get an even faster rotating star that spews out radio like you wouldn't believe, it's probably doing it spinal tap, right? It's doing it yeah. at eleven, right? Yeah. <laughs> our star is doing it at four or five. This thing doing it at 11 so i think that if we're right and the data seems to be supporting us then this a similar mechanisms must be happening on other stars so that to me even though my emphasis is really on the sun that's when it really opens up pandora's box we have a significant group of amateur radio operators who are also amateur radio astronomers right. and with the cheap technology that's out there now some of these little usb dongles software defined radios receivers mm -hmm. and some stuff you can pick up at a home box store, Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, there are people fooling with this. They may not know what they're doing from a scientific point of view, but they're getting a lot of cool stuff. And yeah. that's beginning to draw them into some of this because not only our star, but look at look at the other stars. This has been just an exciting conversation. I think you have illuminated for our listeners why there, there is a difference. Well, but I, I really think more, more illumination because scientists always say your metric of how deep you understand the science is 
how well you understand the confusion in the science. You know what yeah. you don't know. But I think you've illuminated why your research has been met in some circles with distrust by amateur radio operators because they follow the traditional dogma. They cut their teeth during the famous cycle uh, 19 and, and, uh, and surrounding yeah. that where yeah. with, uh, you could work the world on 10 meters. Uh, and, and so what this is doing is saying you've got another set of measures that you believe theoretically drives the sunspots only. And in time series yeah. modeling in general, whether it's electric power use, where, you know, a number of other things, you need these other factors and understand the fundamental forces. Right. And often predict predictors don't want theory. They want numbers. We're tracking the fundamental, right? We can track the fundamental. And so I have a strong feeling that we're not wrong. Yeah. Uh, we don't understand the physics of why, why how it works. We don't understand why 55 degrees is so important, but I can show you it being important going all the way back to the dawn of the observational record. But I think it's telling us something about the geometry of, of the star's insight. Uh -huh. It's actually tell it's telling you something very important about how the star works. So no, there's all kinds of fun stuff that's going to drop out of this. So I'm I'm excited but scared at the same time. Well, the, the kind of uh, fear factor, if you will, for scientists is not unusual for those who aren't scientists but like discovery in general. It's the thrill of that discovery that often makes scientists go in research organizations and universities for less pay than they could make out yeah. in industry. It's that thrill of the hunt. This is not unlike what we do with contesting in amateur radio, the thrill of contacting so many people under different conditions. And so I think our yeah. listeners will will certainly hear that. I'm going to end this interview this way. I want to pre-book for our guest, uh, uh, Dr. Scott McIntosh. I want him to reprise the role as the Terminator. I'll be back. Get to the chopper. Scott, thank you for your time. I know you've got a lot of things to do and you're you're a busy person. If you do have time, tell us the website for your organization so some of our listeners can go look at your website and see everything that you offer to the public. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I will read it out to you. It's www.ncar, N-C-A-R dot U-C-A-R dot E-D-U. So it's N-C-A-R dot u dot E-D-U. Great. That is super. And I want to give a real shout out to our uh, listeners in Scotland. We didn't forget about you. We brought you the mother tongue in this interview. <laughs> And so, Dr. <laughs> McIntosh, thank you, and say hello to your three-year-old. We appreciated her bright laughter, and that's always encouraging to us. So and that's it for the out, uh, right? interview, and thank you for being here. What thank you. you. Yeah, I mean, you're you're tremendously insightful. So well, I, I appreciate I appreciate your background knowledge and uh, your comforting words. We've just heard a deep dive into what may be a paradigm shift in our understanding of the sunspot cycle as we hams know it. It's complicated, but perhaps Richie Havens has summed it up best for us. Little darling Seems like so many years since it's been there Here comes the sun here comes the sun, and I say, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's gonna be all right. Musical credits in this feature include I'll Follow the Sun by Stuart Aiken. See his amazing work at guitarandbeyond.com. Here Comes the Sun by Richie Havens, published by the U.S. government agency Voice of America on their YouTube channel. No copyright is claimed. That's all for this interview segment for the ICQ podcast. This is Frank K for FMH, Fox Michael Tell. ICQ, do you? Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. Well, there, thank you very much to Frank Howe, Kilo 4. Foxtrot Mike Hotel for his fascinating uh, interview there with Dr. Scott uh, McIntosh uh, from the National Center of Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, certainly, I'm sure sunspot cycles and, and solar cycles, etc., are something that is all uh, very exciting for us all. And uh, certainly, Scott's uh, insights are certainly very interesting and certainly uh, uh, potentially uh, opens up a very enjoyable time. Would you not agree, Dad? 
Yeah, certainly agree with you, Colin. And I think, uh, guys, you're going to have to listen to this feature uh, at least a couple of times because there's a hell of a lot in it. As um, you know, it it really does need you to pay attention in some ways, but uh, very very interesting, and it gives us a better insight into the uh, solar cycle and uh, where sunspots happen and all those sort of things. So. Very, very interesting, but you won't get all of it on the first pass through. I'm sure of that because I certainly didn't. So back to you, Colin. Yeah, I think I was saying to you that I'm, I had to uh, make sure I turned it down. To I normally listen to podcasts slightly faster than at one at one X. Um, I certainly turned this one down and sat back and you know made sure I had a uh, thinking space to take it all on board. It certainly is full of uh, great information. So uh, thank you to uh, Dr. McIntosh and thank you to uh, Frank uh, Howes there for setting up that uh, interview. Uh, really do appreciate there for you. Now, of course, this is the sort of uh, value that we bring along uh, as part of the ICQ podcast. And uh, we'd like to thank our donors that uh, keep the show uh, advert free and see the value in what we do. And um, along with our month and subscription donors episode, uh, Richard Langmead, uh, 5B4 Alpha Juliet Golf uh, was our uh, monthly, uh, uh, sorry, our one-off donor uh, this episode. So thank you very much, Richard, for helping us out there this episode. I know you know Richard and uh, Christine uh, very well from your trip to Cyprus, Dad. And I know it's been a while since I've, I've sort of caught up with maybe a couple of years ago, I caught up with on their last trip to London. Um, but I say it's great to hear from Richard and Christine and they're all well in Cyprus and they're enjoying the hobby there in the sunshine. Certainly, it certainly is, Colin, and uh, thank you, Richard, and uh, I will try and get in touch fairly shortly. We we can do it on DMR, uh, we can do it on, obviously, uh, Skype or whatever, but uh, best wishes to you and Christine. It's a shame that, A, you haven't made it over to the UK uh, due to lockdown this year for your six or seven weeks you normally come over, and I haven't made it to Cyprus, but uh, we do think of you guys, so... Uh, Look after yourselves. Back to you, Colin. Exactly, exactly. Well, uh, Dad, anything just off on your end uh, that we need to just cover off before we uh, thank the rest of the guys uh, for the show? Anything you're up to over the next couple of weeks? Not overly. Uh, unfortunately, I'm missing pretty much every club meeting. Uh, due to shift patterns, I miss every major club meeting of the Sutton and Team now through till about February, apart from one. So... A- any uh, supplier or whatever, or somebody who's going to do a talk for us, I apologise. Unfortunately, I finish work uh, about 25 miles away, and it's not an easy drive, 25 miles away, uh, about the time that the talk normally starts. So uh, I won't be at club meetings, but uh, hopefully I'm going to get out and do a bit more operating. I was out uh, the other week uh, with Chris and Martin and uh, fancy doing a bit more. So there I am, Colin. Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, I said we just need to finish up thanking our colleagues for this episode. So uh, Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, and Bill, Whiskey Charlie 3, bravo for taking part in the news roundtable there with your dad. As always, uh, we'd like to point you in the direction of our usual uh, bits and pieces for you. The uh, newsletter that you can sign up for on the website where you can uh, keep updated with all the news information over the uh, coming uh, days to our next episode. Obviously, there's the Facebook group and our Twitter handles at M1MRB and at Colin Butler. And uh, if you want to see our pretty faces on video, uh, our YouTube channel has some of the videos that we've done, obviously, at previous Hamfest, etc. So you can find that at youtube.com forward slash ICQ podcast. Right, well, I think that's just about uh, everything covered off. As always, guys, we really appreciate you uh, listening to the show and downloading. Uh, let everybody else know you know in the hobby about what we're doing, particularly that uh, feature there will be of interest to a lot of people. Uh, so let them know from there. Um, and as I say, you know, everything you can do to help us grow and get involved, uh, we'd always appreciate that. Now, talking about getting involved, Dad, as always, at the end of every episode, you have a very important task to do, and that's to uh, get, make a cup of tea for uh, for Mum and uh, find a chocolate bit here for uh, Mrs B. I certainly do have, Colin, but pretty faces. I've got a face for radio, son. Never mind. Um, Mrs. B and me are going to uh, spend some time together over the next couple of days, which is always enjoyable. And uh, we'll be back soon, won't we, Colin? We certainly will, guys. We'll be back in in a fortnight's time. 73 is all. 73. 